before I even start, uh, I, it, it's a shame that desktop team is not listening or, or seeing this, but I'm sharing my screen from Firefox running on the Wayland session in FreeBSD uh, using Pipewire. So this is pretty awesome. There is no X11 involved whatsoever. Uh, uh, this may be even a, uh, be a topic for mini talk at some point. How do we get modern desktop environment running on FreeBSD? Um, so yeah, um, this is an incomplete talk. Um, so far, it's, I started it as a as an attempt to um, collect in one place uh, my mental picture, my, my my mental framework, how I approach jails, um, especially coming from Linux mm -hmm. background. I wanted to introduce some structure into the conversation about, you know, what do we have in FreeBSD, what features do we want to have, how do we compare it to what is what exists on the Linux side. I think it is important to at least be aware how similar problems are solved in Linux world. Uh, first, for uh, the most important reason is to avoid certain mistakes or the, like unfortunate design patterns that uh, Linux has. And maybe to draw some inspiration because Linux did not get everything wrong. They did get some things right, I think. Um, and the comparison can be also useful to um, sort of identify the gaps and see where we have something, where we don't have something, etc. So container problems. Um, Lots of conversations that I see happening on the internet and the Reddit, and even some conversations that are happening in our IRC channel, uh, have have this sort of set or pro set of problems, and um, it, you know, it comes from the fact that uh, the uh, understanding of what is a container is not very well defined and every person has its own understanding or its own mental picture of what is a container and some other like other people have other pictures so it's not very well synchronized so we often see questions like oh what is the difference between vm and the container this is actually one of the uh, uh interview questions that uh are asked <laughs> uh, the interviews when you know the sysadmins or DevOps are being hired. This is one of the most um, one of the questions that is asked most often, and uh, the answer to this will show you how good somebody understands you know the the topic. Now, how does Docker compare to jails? Another example. I've, I've shared the um, uh, link to my email at the mailing list a, a few years ago where this topic was uh, intensively discussed on the mailing list. Um, and I think comparing Docker to jails is comparing apples to oranges. They are not the same thing and it's not fair to compare one to another. And then like, are containers secure? Are jails, like they're supposed to be lightweight. Can I run my stuff in the container and will it solve my problems or all kinds of questions that is impossible to answer without even without understanding what kind of container are we talking about. The answer may be yes, the answer may be no, or something somewhere in between. It's like we cannot have an intelligent conversation without understanding what kind of a container and what container is. So when people are saying container, what what are they talking about? And there are all kinds of containers, actually. And the, the, the first example of a container that is actually exists for a very long time is CPU execution domains or, or, or rings. We are all heard of ring zero, right? Uh, which is highly privileged uh, context of, of uh, code execution in the CPU. And virtual memory, which is 
you know, container for a process to have their own, its own memory addresses so it does not corrupt um, uh, other processes' memory. I'm, I'm the youngest person in the room, at least, I, I think so. I, I assume everybody remembers Windows 95 days where there was no such thing as virtual memory and your buggy game or your crappy software could corrupt the entire system and you crash the entire OS and then you need to reinstall Windows 95. I did this every other day while I was playing games as a kid because this was the only way to keep uh, keep the system, <laughs> sort of keep my computer operational because there was no memory container, right? Um, Another sort of a container is you know, discretionary access controls we have on the file system and uh, then TRUD. Uh, those were supposed to be, you know, to segment access to, to the file system tree for various users and, um, and give them different permissions, but it didn't work out really well. At least it doesn't work. It doesn't solve all of the problems today. Um, I can dive deeper into DAC. I have a, like I, I give a separate talk at work about you know how DAC and Truth sort of failed and uh, why all other security mechanisms were in, invented to fix problems introduced by DAC. Uh, FreeBSD jails is the container that this group is sort of you know has in mind when we are talking about containers. There are all other kinds of containers as well, like Mac mandatory access controls, which are like Mac framework on FreeBSD, SE Linux, App Armor on Linux. These can also be thought as a containers because they restrict the access uh, to the environment for a specific application, but they do it in a sort of different way than jails do. Um, Linux namespaces is the closest thing we have to FreeBSD jails and Linux. Virtualization, Beehive, KVM, and you know, VirtualBox, Hyper-V, and whatnot. So all, 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 all of these can be seen as containers as well. And uh, what kind of problems containers are usually solving? So they're, they're usually solving a host of problems. I tried to list some of them. They, it's probably not a complete list. So you, your feedback is highly appreciated. If you can think of any other um, problem, uh, feel free to you know, give me a suggestion or even edit the uh, presentation. Um, so I think the primary reason, the uh, primary problem that containers are solving is security and security through workload isolation. It's like the problem older as, as, as me, or maybe even older than me. And uh, I want my thing to be running in a sort of isolated sandbox where nothing can touch it and it, it can touch nothing else. Um, surprisingly, this isolation approach uh, has sort of side effects or benefits is that when we can have better hardware utilization, if we can put multiple workloads on the same host, right? Uh, typical example, your application needs Python version 2.6 and another application needs Python 3.5 or what, whatever. And having both running on one host is problematic if you're not using virtual env, which is another kind of a container, or if you're not using jails, or if you're not using Docker containers, or if you're not using VMs, right? It's like, Setting up Python is, is a major pain in the butt. And if we can sandbox each workload, we can have better uh, hardware utilization. And through better hardware utilization, we can also get, gain multi-tenancy, meaning we can give more people, different parties can have access to the same hardware and, and uh, they can you know, coexist without impacting each other too much. I'm not talking about noisy neighbor problems. They are not solved by, by this, but uh, still. And another side effect of workload isolation is 
improved packaging or portability of your workload, right? If you have a way to package the whole environment, it, it becomes much easier to take this thing as a single tarball and put it somewhere else and it will just work on another machine, right? We all, I, I don't have this on, on the slide, but I wanted to include this famous memes like, oh, it works on my machine, then, then we will ship your machine, right? This is how we will ship. This is what containers are doing in, um, well, under the hood, that's basically, you know, shipping the whole machine thing. Uh, and when we have a reproducible environment, we can have a recipe to build it and it becomes reproducible. We can give a, give a recipe to someone else and they can repeat these steps and have the same environment built. Um, we can reliably reset the environment to a known good state by either wiping it and you know just unpacking it from from our tarball or using ZFS or whatnot, doing you know uh, rollbacks. Um, uh, and resource control. Uh, if we have a sandbox that has one or more processes running in it, it's much easier to apply resource limits and restrictions on the container itself, rather than trying to apply it on every process running inside of container, because trying to identify what belongs to a container using processes is rather problematic. So yeah, containers have also different applications. And based on the application, the implementation may be very different. This is just an idea. This is not a you know, complete list of how we can think about containers, but containers can be you know, server-side workloads, and they can be persistent. And this is an example of a traditional jail in the FreeBSD or LXC in you know Linux world. They can can be server ephemeral workloads. Then we can think of like Docker container running on a server or a Kubernetes pod running in the Kubernetes. On the desktop side, we can also have Docker. I just didn't. I I don't know if there is a pattern of using Docker for desktop applications. The most um, popular con containers for desktop apps in the Linux world are Flatpak, Snap, App Image. Um, I don't think we have something like that on FreeBSD, um, but there are ways to jail uh, X11 applications. I've seen that somewhere in the wiki. Um, that is to say that in order to understand what containers do and how they work, we need to you know, understand nuances. And in order to understand nuances, we need to go deeper than the surface level uh, and talk about specifics and implementations. So uh, this is where I think we should specifically talk about kernel mechanisms and then about specific user land tooling to orchestrate kernel mechanisms and then ecosystem that can grow around uh, this tooling. Um, so Linux containers. This is another interesting thing that I hear a, a lot when people talking about Linux containers. But what is a Linux container? And the answer is, there is no such thing as Linux container. They're like. If in, J in FreeBSD world, we do have a jail, and jail has an ID, like jail ID, we can point at it like this is, this is the container we are talking about. In Linux, there is no such thing, because Linux containers are implemented through three different kernel mechanisms, namespaces, capabilities, and C groups. And they can be mixed and matched in almost arbitrary ways. So when we're talking about a Linux container, we cannot definitively say what kind of container it is. We sort of understand that this may be one or more of, of these, right? Um, 
and probably namespaces are the uh, most important bit of, of this uh, of this mechanism. I definitely don't want to dive into C groups or capabilities. Not not today. Maybe sometime later, and maybe not in this talk. Um, so namespaces. Uh, what is a namespace? Uh, understanding what is a namespace is important uh, because this concept is not Linux only. This concept is actually much much more widespread than we think. Um, and uh, understanding Linux workspace uh, uh, namespaces can help us to understand how jails work under the hood as well. So namespace is also a synonym to, to a partition. And partitions or namespaces, they control visibility to a specific type of a resource. We can think of, um, you know, in the jail, you see your own process IDs, but you don't see other process IDs. Um, this is a partition of process ID of you, right? Whether we have distinct IDs like or duplicated IDs in both ways, it's, it's a diff different conversation, but this is a different view of the process ID. Uh, namespaces or partitions, they solve a problem of having multiple instances of the same thing, right? And, and it's not a new idea. We've seen it everywhere. Uh, one of, uh, of the use cases that came to me yesterday was like uh, fat partitions. We all knew that there was such, such a thing as fat, fat partition, uh, fat file system, and we can divide it into four primary partitions, and then one of those primary partitions can have an extended partition and have as many of the uh, you know, those extended partitions. Those are namespaces as well, and it's a namespace for file systems. Right. We, if you want to have more than one file system on your disk, you need to have multiple partitions. As I said before, virtual memory is, is a namespace or a partition for operating system memory address space. Even apartments in the condo building are partitions of a living space with their, their own distinct numbers. So namespaces in Linux, they are partitioning specific system resource, uh, and then they can you know, uh, provide individual views for processes into these, uh, for these resources or individualized access. And in Linux, there were seven, I think, or maybe in the beginning was seven namespaces, then they added a few more, and then they added a user namespace, which is like this Sauron's ring is, is designed to bring them, uh, to, to rule them all together. Uh, most important of these namespaces are mount namespace, network namespace, and process ID, feed namespace, which have direct analogs in, in the jail world meaning you can have your own view of the file system, you can see only your process IDs, and you can have your own uh, networking stack or at least your own view of the uh, uh, network devices. Um, in the Linux world, user namespace is somewhat special. It, it, like, it, it is the closest thing that exists to jails in, in, in the sense that user namespaces in Linux can be hierarchical. And user namespace owns other namespaces. So if you, as a user process, want to have a separate view into the uh, you know, file system tree, you need to unshare your user namespace first so you can unshare your mount and like have an individual mount, name, uh, mount namespace. The terminology is somewhat um, unfortunate in Linux, I should say. They, they use this word unshare. They want to say that you have already uh, you know, a set of namespaces that you get by default. And if you want to have your, your own namespace, you need to sort of unshare the existing namespace from you, sort of like say, I, I don't want to use this anymore. Just give me a new, new namespace that I can use. 
it's an equivalent of sort of in the FreeBSD world, we can think of like jailing yourself or like jailing the process, but because namespaces in Linux are so granular and they can be mixed and matched, it's like I want to jail myself only in the sense that I want to see separate network devices, but everything else should be shared with the rest of the system. So we can give a very rough definition of what Linux container is looking through the prism of namespaces. Linux container is at least one unique or unshared namespace, one or more, and the other inherited namespaces, if there are any other inherited, but could be none. But it is at least one unique namespace that it is unshared from the uh, default set that was provided to the process. Um, before we dive into comparison, I want to drive a certain point home saying that like, as a FreeBSD user, you might say, okay, namespaces are a Linux concept. And you know, like, why should I care? I'm a FreeBSD user, we have jails, right? And we ask, what is a FreeBSD jail? And free, I, I just give you a couple of quotes here. So a jail is a collection of namespace transformations. This is page four of FreeBSD Mastery Jails book, which I happen to own, which was written by Michael, Michael W. Lucas. An amazing book, I, I highly recommend it to everybody. I can say, okay, maybe Michael W. Lucas smoked some something interesting, and he, you know, dreamed of this namespace word in the FreeBSD. Like, I, I don't see this name, this term namespace, is in any manuals, right? Maybe, maybe he is just wrong. Then we look at another definition, and it says FreeBSD is a jail, jail facility provides the ability to partition the operating system environment while maintaining the simplicity of Unix root model. And this is the uh, Paul Henning Camp, his jails paper, the favorite one, the famous one, sorry. And we can see that he's using the term partition here, which is, I think, is synonymous to namespaces. And let's finally look at one more source. Jails is a collection of processes with a common namespace transformations, including file system root, virtualized networking, IPC subsystems, and mutual, mutual visibility for inter-process operations. This is designed in an implementation of FreeBSD operating system, which I have on my table, page 181, if somebody is interesting, interested to looking at this exact quote. So the whole point of this is to say that namespaces do exist in FreeBSD. They're just not explicitly visible to, to, to users. They are packaged in the form of jails. So, and here I try to do comparison of what Linux namespaces look like and how they can be sort of compared in this, in that sense to uh, FreeBSD. So in the FreeBSD, jail is a sort of a collection of namespaces that are already sort of glued together with that we we don't have as much flexibility as we have in the Linux world, but we do have some flexibility today. Like for example, um, VNet or, or, or uh, separate networking namespace, which is VNet actually is, it can be used separately. Uh, sorry, it can be added on top of the jail. Right, so we can say that we can add the net network namespace to our jail, or we can not have it and have a sort of like a sort of share that's not as as clear cut because even non VNet network uh, jails have some restrictions. So um, forgive me for in my inaccuracy. I just try to uh, compare it to how it may look in jail. And uh, we can sort of have a mount namespace, right? We can say that we can not have it if we say our jail is rooted at the, at the system root, and we will see the same thing as we see outside of the jail. So in that sense, we can add or remove a mount namespace to our jail. What we cannot add or remove is process ID namespace, 
IPC namespace and uh, UTS namespace in Linux terminology stands for uh, host name namespace, right? Your jail has a distinct host, uh, host name from, from your host. This is what we get by default, and I don't think it is easy, but it's impossible or at least not easy to have these common with with the host system, right? So every jail gets the wrong book and there is no way to opt out. Um, it's not a fair comparison as well. And FreeBSD has its own implementation quirks and interesting um, inconsistencies, or at least if inconsistencies in the sense that like if we compare it to Linux world, it's not um, what Linux done. So good thing is jails have their own jail ID. It's a unique identifier in Linux world. There may or may not be an equivalent. The, like, if your container in Linux world happens to not have a separate user namespace, then there is no single identifier for your Linux container. This is what people don't usually uh, know, but your container in Linux is just a collection of namespaces. They all have, have different IDs, and it's almost impossible to understand how different IDs relate to each other. There is no concept that unifies them. As I said, VNets cannot be used separately, but they're sort of a, a network namespace. But Interestingly, that a separate routing table can be used separately. There's, there's a command called set fib or get fib. So this is something to think about, like why VNet, uh, VNet cannot be used outside of jails. Should it be usable outside of jails? Should set should um, uh, routing tables be usable outside of jails? I don't know. These are good things to think about. Where FreeBSD also shines is that VNet, VNet is a completely separate networking stack that allows you to have a like even a separate firewall instance. Like you can have a PF that runs on your host, and you have a separate PF running on your jail with the different rules. You cannot have that in Linux. And Linux is still the same networking stack, just different visibility into um, um, network uh, devices. Um, mount namespace sort of can be thought of, you know, you, we can use it separately. It's true, right? We can use truth and we can, truth is not a jail, but we can still get a different view into the file system tree using truth. Um, Unfortunately, mount namespace, which is implemented using truth in FreeBSD, is just a view of a subtree of your system tree. Where in Linux, it it is just it's more than that. Um, mount namespace in in Linux allows you to have different mount points visible in different namespaces. Meaning, if you're if you have your own mount namespace, you can unmount a disk, and the process running in the container will not see a disk, but processes running outside of this container that have their another mount namespace, they will still see the disk. There is no way to do that in, in FreeBSD today. Uh, an interesting there is. View. Sorry? There is. There is. Uh, maybe I don't know which one. Uh, what is uh, it? What you can do is you can uh, create a directory, you, uh, mount a nullfs in it, and then mount an empty read-only nullfs uh, in on top of the subtree you want to mask out, and either change root or jail yourself into this view of the file system. I so didn't know about this trick, but yeah. Um, well, what you... sorry. Well, this is true. It's really, really inconsistent. Not inconsistent. Let me choose another word. Uh, you get really weird results uh, typing, for example, ls in uh, situations where uh, 
what happens if you delete the file? What does the top layer contains? What does the, the lower layer contains? And so on. So th these are known bugs. And uh, when we talk about it, it's called UnionFS, or how it's actually implemented. And it's there. And it would be really, really nice for that to work perfectly, because Team Jail would be a matter of well, not so much hassle as they are today. Yep. Um, yeah, so taking to the extreme, uh, Linux mount namespace capabilities can give you something like this. Your container can have a completely disjoint uh, tree of uh, uh, view into the file system tree from your host. Where in FreeBSD, you usually your host can see inside of the jails file systems, right? It's like a, it, it's a hierarchy of nested things where the top level jail or the host can always see inside of the jail. Where in the, in the Linux world, it is possible to do something like this: your container unshares a mount namespace, creates a uh, tempfs mount and then truths into it, unmounts it, and then creates all like its file system its file system tree there, such that the host will never see uh, uh, the root of, of the container because it is mounted in, this, in a separate mount uh, namespace. So they have completely divergent file system trees, which is not possible to do in, in FreeBSD. I don't know if it's really required, but you know, this is what Linux can do. Uh, process namespace, bid namespace, kinda, sorta, can be used separately through Mac modules uh -huh. and resource control uh, RCCTL in FreeBSD has no separate namespace. Um, and there is no such thing as user namespace in, in FreeBSD in the sense that in Linux, when you are unshare the user namespace, you can have a, you can be root in, inside of your container, but be a, nobody outside of the container. You can have there is this uh, PID and uh, uh, sorry user ID and group ID map that uh, you know translates uh, uh, identifiers between between namespaces. So it is possible to have a workload that has root inside of the container. But if you look at the same process outside of the container, it will be seen as user ID 65,554, and it will be nobody. Uh, we don't have that in jails. If it's, if it's I haven't seen it. Um. That does something else. There are two options. Uh, the one basically become this user in the parent before starting something and attaching to the jail, or uh, the do this as this user inside and the, this this controls which uh, user database is queried to get the uh, numeric values. But no, what Linux does is something else. They actually have, um, and that's something I've missed so far in this uh, discussion is this uh, namespacing should be further um, subdivided into partitioning uh, a, a global namespace like the process ID namespace, in, uh, but is partitioned by jails. The parents can see inside its jails, but the jails can't see outside processes, but they still exist in a flat process ID namespace. And process IDs are in FreeBSD system wide unique, which isn't the thing in Linux where you can have a process ID one in each container. 
which uh, while it may make it easier to support certain broken existing software, which is badly designed, exactly kill na dash nine one. But uh, the problem with this is that suddenly you have the ambiguity where what used to be a unique identifier now uh, requires a namespace ID and the identifier. So now you have a container ID, whatever form this container ID takes in Linux. I don't know the exact form of the container ID, but a process ID is no longer system-wide unique. It can, you, if you truncated it down to a process ID, it, you can have aliasing between different containers or container and host, which is really uh, just asking for uh, really nasty bugs, either race conditions or confused deputies or whatever the um, flaw. So this is a problem. For example, you can have even memory safety without memory virtualization. All you need is access control. You don't have to hide the memory layout. But historically, Unix provides each process with a virtualized view of its main memory. But other operating systems uh, have been transparent about this. For example, Newton OS uh, on the Apple PDAs of the 1990s had a single flat address space among all processes, including the kernel, and still provided memory safety. Yeah, I think Cherry BSD will also have this nice property sooner. Mm, uh, so Cherry BSD goes about it a bit different by yeah. using hardware enforced yeah. capabilities, something we can't have because our hardware uh, doesn't support it without. Yeah. Yeah their special CPU extensions. Yeah. What I was trying to say is that uh, hardware extensions on the Cherry architecture will eventually allow even traditional operating systems to get rid of MMU and uh, you know we can have uh, flat only if... Please allow the gentleman to finish his talk. We can go on and You're talk right. about other minute details later, but please allow him to talk. Uh, <laughs> there was no, it's, yeah, th thanks. Uh, I was, uh, the, the talk is almost finished. Um, so yeah, the gentleman was right. I, sorry, I don't see the name because I, it slides on the, on the screen, but yeah, the process IDs namespace on Linux and FreeBSD are different because on FreeBSD, it is a different view into the same namespace where every identifier is unique, where in Linux, it's a completely different partition that can, where every container has can have its own uh, PID1. And on, on FreeBSD, only root can manipulate jails today, uh, with some minor exceptions, where in Linux, there is such thing as unprivileged uh, containers where normal users can unshare user namespace and become a root inside of their own container. Um, so yeah, these are the um, mostly the things we have covered. That Mac partition is a Mac module that can emulate PID partitioning without jails. Uh, VFS user mount and security BSD and privileged root can sort of give you some capabilities of doing unprivileged jails, or at least part of the jails, where users can mount things without being root or truth themselves without being root. And yeah, this is so far the end of the talk. I, I unfortunately ran out of time yesterday. I couldn't, like there's a lot more I can talk about. We have not touched on C groups versus RCTL comparison and how login classes and jails are interact with uh, resource controls, capabilities on Linux, they are not what you think. There's not, it's not capsicum capabilities and FreeBSD. For completeness, we should also talk about capsicum and why it is not a solution in general for uh, sandboxing an application, uh, at least an arbitrary random application. And mandatory access controls, Mac containers, the question is, should we use them? Can they augment jails? Are they too much hassle? 
Um, and what is the uh, difference in approach to containerizing the workload in the Mac and the JL approach? And yeah, everything else is still not finished. Um, we still need to talk about tooling in the ecosystem. Um, so yeah, uh, this is it. Thanks for your attention. Uh, please share your feedback, thoughts, improvements, uh, whether you like this talk, what you didn't like about this talk. Eventually, I want to you know, make this talk complete such that it can be presented at some conference. Um, it's absolutely fine if it's a joint effort from, from the jail group. Uh, so yeah, thanks, everyone. I think it is. One, two, three, four. Yeah, it definitely is. is it? Yeah, it's working. Can anyone make a noise? One a noise. noise. Okay, great. <laughs> I think this is going to become an internal meme at this point. Uh, I, I do have a question, though. Uh, so, so you said that uh, process tables or namespaced, which means a PID one in the J in, 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 in a container is different than a, a PID one in, in, in the host or any other container, um, which got me to thinking that can this become a collision at like some edge conditions yes. or is Linux kernel handling it in a way that, oh yeah, I'm gonna you know ignore this name space with that like is is that a common issue or not can be a, this can be a security bug if your container if you manage to uh, get access to other namespaces so you can call you know kill dash nine on pid one in a different namespace they were there were multiple security vulnerabilities in linux kernels of of, of these kinds where container escapes were you know performed through leaking other namespaces inside of uh, inside of your container. But if I understood how Linux does it correctly, there is a translation, but there still is a process ID in the parent. It's just a different one, the true one, the, the, like a physical address is the true address of a piece of memory after you've translated from the virtualized tr uh, process ID inside the container. It's not that the host d can't send a signal to the process, but it has to map the container internal process ID to its true process ID, and yet this can even be nested so that you yeah, undo each layer of virtualization to send a signal from outside the container into it, and there have been multiple ways to uh, confuse the system, some of them with security implications, uh, where the parent assumed basically that it got a, re something reads a PID file from inside a container, calls a system call to translate the process ID, and then sends a signal in the host. And if the mapping has been stale enough and you've been clever enough to spoof new process IDs, you could uh, have a good chance of having your um, PID get translated to something dangerous. Yeah, uh, I, I don't have enough uh, working knowledge of the implementation of namespaces in Linux at the moment, so like, Probably that's true. Because of that, uh, the translation is often a miss, uh, um, more of a burden than a feature you really want. You want to partition, uh, uh, basically slice and recombine recursive namespaces or partition uh, flat namespaces. One problem. The Matic uh, corner case, which uh, can't be handled by either of those approaches, is the user IDs because those get stored in the persistent file system. And 
every time you have a big directory or files, let's say a file server or web server or something, uh, you don't want to go over there, allocate a range of user IDs to this jail or container or whatever you want to call it, and then recursively change all the ownership to update those mappings. So there would either be a use case for some kind of a VFS layer translation or? Yeah, Linux already has a specialized file system to fix this problem. They recently introduced, I think it was a remapFS or something mm -hmm. like that, that was just doing one thing, translating user IDs using a map. Um, I th FreeBSD, interestingly, has this functionality already. It just hidden very deep inside of the NFS kernel functionality, because NFS also needs to do uh, uh, ID translation. Um, Is it generic not... enough, or can it only do the features exposed through the uh, exports file? I'm not sure. I only know that it cannot be used anywhere outside the NFS, so it's not possible to generalize this functionality today. But just because the plumbing is missing or because the mechanism isn't uh, already there? I think the plumbing is missing. I think it's just that mechanism is just hidden very deep inside the, of the NFS code and it's not you know, shared or used anywhere else. Thanks. Yeah, I actually found out about this by reading the, that book. It's, uh, it has a nice chapter on NFS and then they share, uh, uh, they talk about this PID translation or sorry, ID translation mechanism there. So user and group IDs, not uh, process IDs? Uh, yes, uh, user and group IDs, yeah. This could also be something used where the mandatory access control could come in useful for jails. For example, to restrict a route in a jail to become only certain ranges of user IDs or something. Um, or like I mentioned in the IRC channel, the, to have um, network access control at the system call layer and restrict a jail or a certain user ID inside a jail to uh, only bind certain ports or connect to certain uh, IP address port combinations so that you do it at the point where the kernel has the necessary context to apply a policy already and not um, have to guesstimate the context uh, from packets. Cyclers, I didn't understand. Uh, did you say the routing table would be nice outside the jail? Yeah, you can use routing table, different routing tables outside of jails today. Uh, man, set fib and get fib. Yeah, yeah, I know about that. I just didn't understand if you said can or can't. You so, can yeah, use it. That's... Uh, without any uh, jails involved. The problem is that this is only the routing table. It doesn't capture things like uh, IPv6 neighbor uh, discovery or ARP in IPv4. So it can be a leaky abstraction. Okay. And uh, in the presentation, you can use all the puns you want, like... Uh, you're talking about jails, and if you're sending a process to the prison, go to prison without passing start or whatever, you know, just, just to, to break the, the technical stuff with some non-technical thing. And, I mean, you remember my presentation. I liked it to add a part or two. And with the Linux jails, I mean... It's like quantum physics. You're not really sure if they're there or not. I mean, the containers. 
So everything technically is perfect. I, I learned quite a few of you from your presentation. Uh, you just don't have to serve it as a technical menu, right? We're human and if you add more human into it, it's gonna really shine. Um, can you be more specific about what parts of the presentation would you, you know, like to see removed or at least simplified? I'm com I, I do understand that it may be a little bit dry, so... Uh, okay, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't move or, or do something drastically. Just it's how human brain works. If you add a joke now and then, we kind of wake up and, and pay more attention. It's, it's just that stupid little quirk of our brains that you as a presenter, anyone as a presenter, I think should be aware that you, you sometimes may just show them the glitter, <laughs> right? So that just don't, <clears throat> uh, I don't know if you looked at how, um, how our classes were in education were made and they came to a conclusion that you can get 45 minutes stops of somebody's attention, but it's much shorter if you're just talking and it can be somewhat longer if you compare it to something really from the real life with the call, with the market, with the, you know, something that people have in their in their life. And uh, I mean, the jails, I hope nobody has that experience, but they know what the jail is. <laughs> right. no, that's, that's true. And uh, in general, I just don't have enough practice of giving talks. So uh, uh, your feedback is completely fair. Uh, it, I do need to um, add more uh, waking up <laughs> brain stimulating things to, to it. Yeah, poke it with electrodes. <laughs> All right, guys, I will unfortunately have to jump off the call and uh, leave early today. Uh, like um, before you leave, I do have a single question. Sure. And there's like two of me now. Is this working? Okay, yeah, it is. Uh, so, so my question is actually simple. Uh, so the, in the Linux world, the tooling is more developer oriented, if I got a trust, right? Like the Docker files and stuff like that. Um, are we missing any kernel mechanisms to be able to achieve that? Does that make sense? Like, or is it more like user land utilities that we're missing? Because I'm, I'm trying to understand if there are any required kernel side of things to achieve that developer niceness. I think for developer niceness, we don't, we are not missing any kernel mechanisms. We may be missing some kernel mechanisms in terms of, you know, how flexible our jails can be. There is definitely room for improvement there, but for, um, developer oriented uh, for the developer user experience we need just better tooling on the in the user land and uh yeah that's uh, that's a subject that will follow like uh, the next thing i want to add to my presentation thank you what, but to sh uh, short is i think we already have a much better foundation than linux because linux doesn't even have something like a jail.conf where we have this in base. In, in Linux, every container technology like Docker or Podman or whatnot, they have their own config formats, their own ways to glue and assemble those namespaces and C groups together. And where in FreeBSD, if we have a base foundation that will allow other you know, third-party jail managers to use it, we will have much more consistency of implementation and make the interoperability better. 
Uh, we should improve and build on top of that to make it even greater. But yeah, I think I think we have a, a better foundation. Um, I just grabbed the freebies resources and found and noticed that there used to be something called uh, UMAP FS, but it's gone now and it was removed in 2007. The mount uh, UMAP FS command. Was, was I want that the notation that is 2007. 2007 625 yeah. UMAP FS removal in uh, obsolete files. Inc. Hmm. Yeah, maybe then the book is not updated because the book is 2014 and it still talks about UMAP FS. Well, at least it mentions it. The mechanism may still exist in some uh, form, but looks like it was removed in FreeBSD 9 or something. Oh, you mean maybe it was exposed as a usable file yes, system? Yes, as a like virtual here. file system. Oh, cool. So yeah, maybe it was. I wonder why it was removed. Maybe because it was, uh, you know, code rot and bit rot and nobody used that. It was buggy, but yeah. Um, And actually, I, I, that's a separate question, whether we should try to do everything that Linux does. And you know, process ID translation can be a cool thing. Oh, sorry, user ID and group ID translation can be a cool thing. But it adds so much more complexity and weird corner cases to everything that um, part of me thinks maybe it's not worth it. I would argue against. Uh doing it inside the kernel and translating it at the system call boundary, but translating it inside the file, virtual file system so that basically an overlay mount point would have rules how to rewrite either add an offset or whatever uh, to the user and group IDs returned from the underlaying file system. That would be probably quite straightforward to add and would solve the normal use case that you have an image and you want to uh, um, have uh, basically map this image into the Ampharel jails um, range of currently accessible um, user IDs and group IDs. So this, the idea here I've seen in the, on the Linux side is that they want to have each container, so user UID and group ID namespace uh, map, let's say the lowest 2000 or so IDs or 10,000 into uh, a large range on the parent somewhere and, and it's offset by some bias so that each container is on the parent a unique range of non-overlapping IDs in the so you partition the 32-bit flat ID namespace by partitioning it into ranges. And the problem now is that if you want to have the two uh, containers share certain, uh, for example, file system images, unless you want to uh, change all the group and uh, user ownership information in each instance of a file system. So you would have to create at le the very least copy and write the changes. And that, that's expensive and doesn't scale because the more IDs you have, the more expensive it gets. And by doing these kinds of translations, and it could be uh, basically as simple as a uh, describing a range and some operation to perform on that range, either a table lookup or an offset addition that you could do in a virtual file system overlay, which would be quite fast. And the important part is that you're using the true user IDs and group IDs 
at runtime, but you're mapping them to others in the virtual file system. Yep. And I, I, I think that's pretty close to what Linux does, actually. They also have a lookup table to, to make things fast. So um, th that is actually interesting. So I found a, a mailing thread that apparently I wrote. I'm sorry. In, in like two years ago that, that I totally forgot about, which the topic was something like this. That if you do PS AUXD dash J into a jail, uh, it is, you know it will print the the user IDs. But let's say you have a user ID inside a jail, a user with the ID one zero zero one, but you don't have a user one zero zero one on the host. So in the user table in, inside the user, it will say not you know AV or Jack. It will just say the print the number on the host inside the jail. It will print fine because it will find it in Etsy in Etsy password. So the interesting thing is we actually apparently had a long discussion on the mailing list on is this a solvable problem? And there was apparently two quote unquote solutions. One of them was actually forking, uh, was forking um, PS every time that it needed to print something about the jail. So it would fork, go inside the jail, get some information and the parent would somehow get that information, which I'm still not sure how. And another idea was to actually have a visualized UID table, which uh, Jan, I think that's what you're suggesting in a sense, right? So we can no. partition. No, okay. No, uh, what I'm arguing for is to just please, please, please don't add virtualization to the user and group IDs or process IDs. So don't map them or translate them um, at the system core level because that way you get confused deputies like I described in the minutes where some, let's say some supervisor or some health check finds that the service is unresponsive, reads the PID file written by the demon supposed to run inside the container and sends a signal as a privileged process to this a process ID, which is some random process ID in the uh, larger parent context. So um, that's just adding so much complexity and burdening everyone with this complexity. Um, the kernel mostly doesn't, except for maybe NFS v4 corner cases and so on, the kernel doesn't really care about user names. And even in NFS v4, you can configure the kernel to use a numeric name to avoid the need for mapping, reverse mapping user IDs back to user names to send them over the wire as name. But um, the kernel really doesn't care about the name. It's the user. and scripts and other user space tooling which cares mostly users for demons a numeric user id is what we need at the end and if you look it up it can't be mapped and you get it back and as the numeric mapping uh, your system call will still work it's just that the uh, system operator is confused when he sees a process with no human readable name attached instead just a number yeah, I, I, I think um, that is a valid concern mm -hmm. and uh, implementation should be on the VFS overlay layer okay. such that we're only writing things to disk, like we're translating when we're writing mm -hmm. things to disk. So and you can't... It... Sorry, go ahead. And if you uh, aren't prepared to restrict what is allowed to happen inside the guest, you can't depend on the fact that the guest is able to even run something like PS. Maybe there is no user database in there because it's a very tightly locked down jail with only the very minimum number of files required, maybe even empty, an empty root directory for the jail. In that case, you wouldn't be able to get any useful resolution from that. And even if it is, the question is, are you running the PS from inside the jail, whereby demanding that it follows the same uh, argument conventions? So for example, how would you handle in that case something like a Linux container 
now on inside the FreeBSD jail, where you run something like a branded executable, which uses a different output format and which doesn't have libxo support to write it in nice JSON suitable for parsing and reformatting. Or you would have to have the um, container uh, have the files in the format the parents PS can read, which is also problematic because uh, I don't think uh, libnss has ever been written under the assumption that there are container boundaries involved in the uh, NSS modules. So each NSS module now would have to become jail or container area. Or you would enforce at least the very least that there must not be uh, format incompatibilities between the guest and the host database format. And all of us would also be quite heavyweight on a big host with thousands of jails potentially. You don't want and tens of thousands of processes. You don't want to fork off a PS per process. So you would have to also manage the basically cache for process in case you want to ask it for another mapping from this namespace. So it gets very expensive. And I think the best trade-off would be to explain to users that, sorry, you can't have that. With the caveat that some user space tooling with the help of an NSS module could install, uh, if it has the permissions to do it, an additional uh, directory of mappings to query rather than the Basically, in certain like jail files or something, NSS module would look up the J under the uh, would loop over the ranges defined. So if you partition the namespace, it would look up which jail ID is assigned this partition, and then it would uh, expect that some outside user space tooling provides it a mapping it can read. That would work but it would, would require gluing stuff together in user space. That, that's actually a very valid problem. You know, that like forking PS a thousands of times for oh. every jail, that's problematic. And also uh, apparently, yeah, you're right. For example, a lot of subsystems are not jail aware. Now that could be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on your point of view, you know, like, you know, the, only the host should know what the jail is and no other thing should even care. But of what the jail is, you know what I mean? Coming back to the very start of the talk where you uh, argued that the most important part about uh, containers uh, is the secure workload isolation. You can already have that in 1980s or at least 90s Unix if you run each uh, workload as a dedicated user with resource limits, but it's not and transparent. Just, just want to say, Igor, thank you. Oh, for yeah. the talk, very interesting, and hopefully see you next week for the continuation. See you around. Do we have any topics Sorry. for those remaining? Uh, I wanted to ask some questions, actually, but uh, Mecca, do you have any updates on your C work? I think you were working on some stuff. Yeah, the skeleton pro uh, project is assembled. It's far from production code, but I I understand how UCL and lists and EXO come together, uh, which is a huge step, and how the kernel and user space communicate, at least in a very narrow example of exchanging envy list as a, as a, how to say a messenger the the message carrier mm -hmm. uh, so i do understand the concepts and uh, alan just said that ucl to envy list conversion function would be interesting to 
other people and other projects. And I can see why there are problems because even if you look at my implementation, there are, there are holes in it because I don't know what to do with it. Uh, for example, uh, and we'll so, 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 uh, uh, so, sorry, just to be clear, you're talking about a generic function that converts between NVList and a UCL that can be used both inside and outside of FreeBSD that other subsystems of the kernel or, you know, the user land can use as well. Um, well, yes and no. NVList is not wide, widely implemented in other operating systems. And I don't know if there is a library for it. Uh, I just didn't explore much. I know Solaris has them and uh, ZFS has somewhat changed. I mean, not changed, but uh, differently implemented any lists. Uh, I don't know how portable can it, uh, can it be, but inside the FreeBSD, if your project uh, uses SendVillist and UCL, in that case, you would have just one function to do the, well, you're, you already have one function to do it. It's just your function, right? And this way we wouldn't have to write it all the time. The other function I really want to see in the base is SendVillist XO. It's a working name. I don't know what, what the name will be in the end, but having uh, X, uh, sorry, having Anvil list printed out, uh, emitted out with an Excel library uh, is actually not that hard. Uh, I, I'm going to be honest, and out of all three libraries I mentioned, the least amount of time I needed to figure out how it works is with XO. And it's not, it's not a surprise. I mean, it, it solves the uh, problem of printing out data. Analyst and UCL have a much bigger chunk to, to queue and it, it's kind of understandable. Anyway, I would really love this uh, project to become a skeleton and uh, something like user share example project directory. And then we could say to the world, hey, this is how you uh, jumpstart your project. Yes, you use CP, right? You just copy this hierarchy that some developers agree through the reviews and, and documentation and whatnot. This is a really good way to start the project. Please use this. And, oh, and so, be so, so, so it would have the basic, let's say, uh, bare bone, uh, like, like, like a skeleton for libucl, libexo, Lib uh, NV list or and it doesn't have a lib NV list and maybe even things like uh, QA that all of these things FreeBSD has that in case anyone else adds any other bits into FreeBSD they can just use that and understand okay I don't need to use as printf I can use the you know exo emit which now the, the the skeleton already has that ready for me to integrate did I did I get it right yes. In the process, awesome. there is there is also a kernel module. Uh, okay, let me take a step back. Uh, I actually didn't understand how, uh, on a deep technical level, I didn't understand how user space and kernel space communicate. And most of the, the communication, I know it's done via either IOXL or CCTL, and you probably shouldn't uh, mix those two. You, you should stick to one syscall and use it throughout your module. Uh, so what I did, I implemented also a kernel module. I extended, I think it's called uh, Arch Handbook that we have. It's a really weird place to have a 
coding example, but it's there. I would expect it to be in a developer's handbook, but whatever example I could find is golden. So I didn't nag much. Uh, so I extended it to support IOCTL and CCPL. And currently, uh, so there is a kernel module and there is a user space program. And the user space program can do four things, actually can do two things. Uh, it can set, uh, read uh, UCL, convert it to another list and send it to the kernel. And the second operation is get the another list and print it. Uh, it can do these two operations using both IOCTL and CCPL. So ideally, if you come along ignorant of how FreeBSD projects are built, and you say, okay, I'm, I'm gonna build my project, and uh, how do I start? This is the bare minimum that I think your uh, kernel and uh, user space implementation are probably going to contain, like in a huge percentage of uh, projects, this is how you're going to end up, uh, you know, with a config parser, with uh, something to store in memory, to store configuration in memory, like Emulist, uh, some conveyor of the messages that Emulist pack and unpack are. And uh, you can, um, see the output of the program even if the kernel module is not loaded because that's the very last operation that the program does and if you see like CCL, uh, CCTL fail for blah 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 reason and because you, you didn't uh, load the module you're going to still get the envelope printed to your screen so you know what's going on. And I think it's a good way to learn how modern FreeBSD projects should look like, or at least at this point, what I consider a uh, modern FreeBSD project, uh, like a fair uh, mix of the libraries that are going to be common in like, let's say just roughly like 90% of the projects. Now, what I intend to do with it, if I can read parts like uh, envy list emits with XO, uh, make it a function in the base and converting UCL to envy list, which I will come back to in just a minute. Uh, there are problems, uh, but that would be really good contribution to all the projects and uh, my skeleton would become smaller because uh, the two huge functions are actually uh, emitting, printing and converting uh, to, to Envil list. Uh, the problems with UCL to Envil list are I think there are two types that are a problem, but right now I can remember only one. And that is that uh, every list has a type called number, but uh, UCL has integer and float. Uh, on top of that, uh, number in every list is unsigned 64, a bit integer and it's always unsigned 64 bit integer. Uh, so that unsignedness is, um, well, can be a problem because integer on the UCL side is signed. And uh, I have no idea how to store float in Envy list. So we might, well, we might be missing implementation on the envelope side, uh, I'm not really sure. Yeah, that is actually a, a very, that's actually a very good 
question and a very interesting problem. Uh, do you think you can also join tomorrow's Beehive call? Because they were one of the first ones who implemented NVList. And I think we can ask them if that's by design or that's by milestone that, you know, that's something that has to be implemented, but they never got to it. Because if it is, then we can maybe modify that in the, in the implementation and have the best of both worlds. Because okay, that, that sounds two, like, yeah. The two answers for yes, I can join. Just send me the, the invite. And the second is, uh, I think that's the situation uh, on free BSD, I think the, the kind of, uh, let's say, excuse is that we did the same that Solaris did. I am vaguely uh, remembering uh, that Envilus reported from Solaris, but don't hold me accountable. In either case, if it's true or not, it doesn't matter because we can change, we can adapt. And if Unrealist needs to be adopted in any way, well, why not? It contains already other uh, simple uh, 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 data types, uh, like mm -hmm. strings, like bulls, like arrays, uh, and nested Unrealist, and so on. So maybe there is some piece of implementation missing, although I would, I would ask myself, how did the, why did Solaris people do it that way? But yeah, that, that's, a, yeah, that's basically um, just, to be, would, just to be clear by Solaris, you mean Il Illumos, right? Uh, no, I think it's older. I think it oh. was Solaris that had angry lists. But I, I really don't know Solaris much, so I might be totally off here. Uh, but yeah, I know Solaris has Envilus, and they, they predate FreeBSD implementation, that's for sure. Understood. Um, Understood. Oftentimes, the kernel really doesn't care about the interpretation of the integer, just about its size, when it has to basically hold on to the information for user space to retrieve, uh, retrieve it later. So for example, well, you, in that case, you can cast the signed integer to an unsigned and back again, as long as you make sure that the types are all of the same size, the value will be preserved. Yes, but you would agree it's really, really cumbersome. Having it's fragile types, and nasty. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So having something that really works well on a technical engineering level defined right uh, and so on, I think that's the right approach, but I saw Envilus a month ago, so I'm not really speaking from a vast experience as a developer who used Envilus. Mm -hmm. So libucl has a richer data type set than uh, libnv. That's correct. With one exception, uh, that being the type of file descriptor. Where That's correct. Where nvlist between running processes can transmit file descriptors via file descriptor passing, but libucl as a text format can't preserve such information, so it doesn't have a type for it. I agree with everything you said. Um, uh, sorry, just I wanted to say what, what I'm going to do next. Uh, this is a skeleton, and I hope in, let's say, various ways, it's going to find its way into the base. Uh, for the next, let's say, iteration of, uh, of my work, uh, I'll, I, no, let me take a little step back. Uh, as a CBSD contributor, I saw the flaws, not, not flaws, but how it can be improved. And uh, uh, it was kind of obvious to me that it's missing a demon that is communicating over uh, 
Unix socket at that time <clears throat> because I didn't want to expose it to the internet. Of course, switching from one to another is really, really easy, but I wanted to start for you to Unix sockets. And I implemented something that remotely resembles packing or unpacking Unreal List and communicating. So I know how to do that part. And now with Unreal List, I know how to do it well. Uh, so what I want to do next is have the daemon that is able to communicate with the kernel and the uh, uh, user space uh, 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 utility that communicates with the daemon. So my working names are G, uh, JLD and JLCTL because I'm not very innovative in this regard. Uh, but I think for now they, they depict what I want to make. And uh, in that, uh, how to say, that, that work, you know, that uh, patch, I also want to have Angular list stick to the jail in the kernel so that future implementation of uh, ePairs mm -hmm. automatically assigned and whatever listing of configuration can be done on, uh, well, we can set the configuration at runtime, at creation time of a jail and read it anytime later mm -hmm. where uh, jail conf or jail UCL, no matter how we call it in the end, uh, may or may not correspond to, to the, sorry, to the actual state of the jail. Mm -hmm. And that way, uh, because I work with uh, Capsicum and, and uh, how it's called, the helper, Casper, yeah? Yes. Uh, I know it can be really nicely separated privileges can be separated really nicely with uh, demon listening on a socket can just talk to the uh, kernel via CCTL because they also are implemented via CCTL and listen on the uh, uh, socket side for the requests. Of course, uh, sorry. that's not all. Yes. Sorry, sorry. By 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 CCTL, you mean system call? Yes. Okay. I, I thought you meant like S Y S C T L. The, the C C T L command. I was like, what? Okay. Yeah. Well, basically, they share me and for a reason, right? They they do the basically same thing. Uh, there there are much more C C T L MIBs than we see through the utility because some are like IOTLs exchanging structs and packed formulas or whatnot. So uh, Alfonso Siciliano, I think, wrote the utility to show you all the CCTL endpoints, uh, MIBs, because they, they look like SN. SNMP uh, MIBs. Oh my God, this this sounds ridiculous. But yeah, the, the, there are a lot of more endpoints in the CCTL ecosystem than the utility is showing, and those that uh, CCTL uh, endpoints have types, and if types are simple, like strings, numbers, and so on. Uh, CCTL utility can show it to you, but if it's a structure or something, then it doesn't even display in a CCTL A, so you won't even see it. Uh, jails have such CCTLs that exchange structs for the parameters, and setting parameters of a jail is actually sending a CCTL to the kernel site. Uh, which does something. So I would love to implement something capsicumized uh, that we can uh, use with the um, 
let's say external tools, but anyone who can communicate with a demon from whatever language, library, implementation, or whatever to the demon, it's a nicely separated implementation and stuff like Python library and later on Ansible uh, support can be much easier achieved. Not that it's right now on my agenda, but it's on a, uh, well, let's say upper part of my wish list that Ansible and other orchestration tools support base deals, let's say out of the box or more natural, more, more nicely and, and be um, Ansible or orchestration friendly in such that you can create other uh, jails and set parameters and whatnot. But on the other hand, it also enables stuff like uh, Jailer or whatever other implementation we, we talk about to coexist and actually use most of the uh, uh, infrastructure and code of the, of the JLD. Uh, if I may call it that, uh, so that, uh, for example, our future jail managers would just prepare the route and create the UCL configuration file. That would be a, a wonderful world. And I think we, I know I can implement it if you give me infinite amount of time. Uh, but always. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, I want to start it and uh, send. The, I seen the, the recording of a last uh, uh, last week's meeting, especially the part with Jamie, and that's basically what he wasn't against. Uh, Okay, we need a demon. Okay, I can see a, a use case for that. Yeah, I'm not against it. Okay, we would need envy list saved uh, 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 configuration in a, in a curl. Okay, I can see the benefit of that and I'm not against it and so on. So that, that's really a boost uh, for, for me because I planned something like that years ago and now the jail maintainer says, well, if somebody does it, I'm not against it. Uh, well, that, that's uh, go, huge. Go, Goran, I, I do agree with you. Uh, I do have a, just a single concern. My worry is, is that we lose that line where the base jail or and slash or jail D turns into a jail manager. You see what I mean? Like that line is so close uh, between this and that because because like the current one that we have has a lot of bugs obviously from the depend issues down to a lot of things but the interesting part about it is that it's so minimal that you can work your way around bugs and you know this is the specific set of skills that it requires uh, if we try to convert the current one that we have into a more modern one with LibUCL and Envilists and stuff like that. My worry is when we start adding things that we shouldn't. One of the good examples was like um, hooks, right? Hooks are important, but at which point hooks become a whole, uh, I want to say, replacement of Docker, you know, a Docker alternative of jails. You see, like there's a, like a simple line that uh, that's my only worry i want to say that's my because because um when i had a question for today but i will bring it back later that at some implementations of jail managers it might be you know some jail managers are wrappers around the jail command and jail conf but some jail managers might actually just need to use the jail syscall that's it like they, they are going to manage everything by themselves, you know? Now, from a free BSD point of view, it, it doesn't matter if you use jail conf or you use that, but just like we learned from today's presentation, right? It's still a jail, regardless of how you create or manage it. Uh, but the idea of converting the base jail, JLD into a modern one should have like a line of, okay, these are the things that it should do 
or it should be rather, uh, but nothing more than that. So we can have a clear separation between a jail manager and the mm. actual jail subsystem inside. And I think it's good that we have both me, you in here from like a jail vendor point of view, as well as Dan, because Dan uses <laughs> only the base tools, right? Like the base tools is all I should ever need to manage visualized free BSD systems. So the, 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 the separation of the lines can be very clear there. Kind of. But does, mm-hmm. does my worry make sense for you? Or like what, yes, what my worry yes is? And, okay. Yes and no. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> yes, I understand what you're worried about. But okay. no, because you have a really, really hard line. And that's a unique socket. You, okay. you don't go past that. And just not to have a JLD with, without any possibility of controlling it, JLCCL, uh, CTL would also be in jail. So you can do like a uh, basic, let's say, perimeter maybe um, operations with the jail. But it would Makes also sense. give you the ability to extend it with whatever tool you actually like. Is it some um, uh, web framework like uh, the Python based? Uh, Rub- okay, yeah, I know Elixir and whatever you like these days. But uh, uh, you know, it's not hard to implement the let's talk to the base JLD demon and make it do more than it actually does. Like, um, I mean. When I say that is if you configure just the uh, root file system for the jail and have a UCL, that's what a daemon should do in 90% of the time. Maybe also execute something in the jail like jail login or, or have it uh, as a outside command or something. That's up for a debate, but the the core functionality of a daemon will be to, to store stop jails and change their parameters, which actually is stopping and stopping is. It's changing parameters right now. So I think that the line is really, really hard. You get to the, in the base, you get to the line where you hit the, the socket uh, either Unix or, or INET or uh, INET 6 or whatever. Uh, but uh, the, the demon is not extensible uh, uh, on its own. Uh, it doesn't know how to, to do different stuff uh, just because you want it to. But the, you, uh, how to call it, the, the UTIL side uh, can have like profiles. And while assembling the jail route, it can have a scale profile and whatnot, uh, but the demon remains simple in that case. So yeah, actually I, I spent around a year thinking about how it would be implemented uh, in a, in a sensible manner. And uh, sensible manner says, do the minimal with a demon, go wild with, if you have to go wild, then go wild with a util. Yeah, Jan, you know. wanted to add something. Yes, uh, I think uh, what you're solving a more complex problem than needs solving. And the question none of you has addressed is why does the kernel need to pass the metadata attached to jails by the jail command you're envisioning or the daemon you're envisioning? The only reason I can see for putting this information into the kernel is so that the information is either meaningful to the kernel or to uh, persist it across process lifetimes of user space process. So a user yeah, space demon one. may die, but if it re- is restarted, it would uh, be able to retrieve the 
data is stored in kernel memory for safekeeping, pass it again, and the kernel doesn't have to care about the format. And the same for, for example, if you want to store which file systems have been mounted for this jail by the jail command and should be unmounted when the jail is stopped by a command, then uh, the command would pass its own information back and the kernel wouldn't pass it. That's, uh, that's a valid point. You, unless you really want the kernel to understand it. And then we are talking about something very di different from just having the kernel hold on to the information. Uh, so there are other places you can keep it. If you ignore the case that user space uh, process can die for a moment, it could be its memory, which would be the most easy to do thing. The next thing would be a dedicated tempfs or something, uh, which would be persistent within reason. Uh, at some point you are trying to save root from himself, which has historically never worked out. Um, so you can't prevent root from doing something intentionally uh, stupid. You only can avoid putting uh, foot guns in the user's uh, way. These are actually very good questions. So let me start with the first one, which was, which was, okay, what if we don't do anything on the kernel side, but instead we just have a user land daemon that communicates, which Goran suggested via socket, Unix socket or an inet socket or whatever socket that you have. Mm -hmm. And it passes the information back and forth, which means that in the current model, there are no information at all saved about the jail. You know, from jail.com, there is only the kernel stuff. But There's when no we have a jail, exactly. But when we have jld, the demon's memory is going to have information that oh, if I stop this jail, then I have to unmount these mm -hmm. file systems that I have mounted. That's actually a very good solution. Uh, no, uh, no, it's uh, not. Unless, oh, go mm -hmm. on. It's not because what happens if you pkl dash nine the jail, jail demon exactly exactly uh, so there the, you want yeah. to have some kind of persistence that could be a file so basically you write you act like a kind of database you have an append log of your intentions you write out your intentions which could be as simple as basically uh startup wall time plus uptime um and a counter or something so that you get a strongly yeah. monotonic ordering that, that, that does make sense. Like and very then you similar to write what... out your intention. And when you have one directory for what you want to do, you have one directory yep. for what you've... Uh, and you just unlink the file if you're done with it. Yep. Uh, and maybe a subdirectory or a name naming convention to indicate partial intention. So if something is partially written out, you obviously didn't manage to uh, rename it. So you crashed yep. before you acted on your intention. So ignore this file and delete it on next startup. If you find yep. a written out in intention as this has been done. Okay, nice. Now you know what to do with that. Um, but of course someone could just unmount the file system containing that. And you're so suddenly adding all of this complexity to user space. So, so very, very interesting that like it, it could act like a state file, very yes. similar to what the DNS servers have for DNSSEC management, right? Like, okay, I need to roll out a new key. I need to do this. I have done that, you know? So a state file that says, uh, these are the jails that I have. And the so, daemon is responsible for managing that file. Why I'm talking about this is that um, the most common example I've seen in this calls is the automatic management of ePair interfaces and the mm -hmm. related addressing for Beehive enabled jails. Uh, sorry, for VNet enabled jails. Yes. The problem with that is that you are, at that point you're so deep into policy, no longer mechanism. The mechanism is I there. See. You're talking about really user facing, user relevant policy. For example, is who assigns the address to the jail is the outside jail demon response does it have its own ip address pool 
to allocate to the jails on this host, where does it get that from? All of this is crosses organizational boundaries because now you're into network management because you need to manage IP address pools and routing and 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 so you are deep inside the Docker plus extensions. So th this is the typical uh, problem of a library versus a framework, you know, concept in, in the web mm, world, right? Like mechanism it, versus policy or exactly. infrastructure versus opinionated tools. Yeah. And the problem is that um, you're throwing it all in, together and you will end up with a tool which again solves your use case like many jail managers before it and will probably be useful for a few dozen other people on this planet <laughs> but you haven't improved the state of the art i see what you're saying i, I see what you're saying gogoran what do you think on on, on that and because i think the, i think that's a valid point where we and by putting the uh state into kernel memory and attaching it to the jail by having a system called basically assign a put, get, or remove a, ver a blob to or a string to a definitely string key for this jail, you remove the complexity of dealing with the um, file system and it's corner cases because the file system is intended to persist across system reboots where the jail state inside the kernel inherently can't outlive the kernel. So you can have a simpler interface because it's by design, unless you're really insane, a very limited data set because the jail and its processes will be a lot larger than its configuration. So you can easily fit it in memory for reasonable deployments. And for example, you could put something like uh, the least to an IP address in there. This or a certain ePair interface and bridge. But so, all of this so would only be uh, meaningful to the user space tooling. The kernel would only be responsible for holding on to this information for retrieval. And the nice thing about this is that you're putting the mechanism in there and the kernel would only enable you to do it with a reasonable amount of code and reliably. Uh, so, 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 so to uh, summarize where we, got, where we got here is is basically what you're saying is we have a jail.conf regardless of the format. Let's say mm -hmm. it's UCL because we're in the future. Okay. A command line utility parses that, make sure everything is okay sends it to a daemon for, let's say, ACLs, which this mm -hmm. could actually be a good solution for having users running jails via permissions. And that daemon uh, puts the information into the kernel, just like we do now, but we might need to change the ABI and have mm -hmm. a location in the kernel where we save extra information, such as you know the mount points, or commands that need to be run pre and post. And then the jail daemon handles the rest, which means if you changed your configuration or you broke your configuration, which is something very common, if you stop the jail, uh, the stopping process is not, is not based on what you have now, for example, but mm -hmm. rather it's based on uh, what you you've already had during the creation. However, this also gives us the flexibility to say, put the new configuration about jail X. Right, and now we can have a. a the, 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 this sounds like a very nice solution um, to all of our problems. Yes, um, but I would argue that I wouldn't um, put the passing into the user space client, the jail C or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. But instead, I would have it send requests to the jail demon and have the jail demon. A fork of a worker per request, then, so that you oh, have I a see. clean environment for this all and have the opportunity to have it run privileged. For example, if you want to have it inspect some file which 
the user isn't supposed to access some, so some API credential. The JLD is allowed to do this and the user is only allowed to invoke configurations. Um, I'm fond of um, using file descriptor passing on Unix sockets for this because it avoids so many complexities with uh, uh, spelling out access control again. Basically, if you can give me a file descriptor to this or that, uh, you are allowed to. And uh, one of the nice things is that you can compare file descriptors for equality under certain conditions. One of them is if they reference files or directories, because then the combination of mount point and inode is unique uh, for a file. And the other nice thing is that in FreeBSD, even for um, pipes, to make anonymous pipes closer to a file force, uh, the kernel maintains unique inode numbers per um, five uh, per pipe on demand. So basically, it lazily mm -hmm. allocates uh, in-memory data structure to, tra uh, to um, track the inode number as soon as you inspected it for a, a pipe. So you can have um, a pipe, and you can use uh, the um, caps writes API with, uh, introduced for capsicum in FreeBSD without ever entering the capsicumized uh, sandbox state because the restriction you put on a file descriptor apply to anyone without entering it. You're, this, and this can be used to, um, to turn um, a pipe into a pure capability object, which is only used for basically re-identifying uh, this capability. And then some other user space process can attach some semantic to getting shown this capability and you can pass it around. And th this way you could have a named FIFO somewhere. And if you can open this FIFO, uh, then you're allowed implicitly to request a certain set of operations on this jail. You could have one uh, name pipe per jail or multiples. And the only use this has is not to pass data for it, but to act as a capability to identify which object the, which has been loaded is referenced. So that I you see. have a, a unspoofable handle for state. I see. Uh, Goran, any thoughts on the methodology that Jan proposed based on the work that you've done and seen? I'm just going to ignore it all. <laughs> okay. Yes. Uh, that's actually no, very valid. Okay. No, uh, I'm going to ignore it at the start and explore the implementation I have in mind okay. because I'm not sure what the right thing to do is. So I'm okay. going to try out a few things and I already gave a thought to, to this one so I know how to work it out. And that's okay. the reason I, I'm for now going to ignore everything Jan said against it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, once I, I like with, with the skeleton, once I learn what's in there, we can have a more serious discussion of how it actually has to be implemented. At this point, I don't even know how to programmatically create a journal. So it would be irresponsible on my side to say, okay, we are going to do it this way. Because let's face it, I have no clue. Uh, and, um, somebody wants out. Uh, so, uh, the, the, I, 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 did know, I did know that you had a cat, but you also have a dog. Yeah, I have three cats and a dog. I had four. Okay. At one point, I had six cats and a dog. So yeah, it's a it's a madhouse, and our living room is uh, also a photo and audio studio, and we're 
Well, yeah, we're born crazy. Uh, that, that's that's why we stick together because we understand each other's insanity. Back to the project. Uh, I really want to try it out because uh, I know we will need some demon. Uh, if we have a demon, we will need some JLCTL or whatever uh, utility. Uh, we already want Envy list in the kernel because if nothing else, uh, ePair automatic assignment and uh, what happens if you, uh, if you delete a file uh, of a running jail, how do you stop it? I mean, stopping is not a problem. How do you clean it up? Mm -hmm. and I think it's just more, uh, how to say, more convenient and more responsible if you just have the uh, configuration that was present at the startup that you can edit. And uh, for now, I want, th there are some things that you can uh, change about the deal at runtime or store at creation time, uh, some parameters, but they are not all. And if you have like dollar ID, that's certainly not going to be saved. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I want to end this. Uh, oh, uh, which, which, which reminds me. I might be wrong. I might be wrong, but I think that Solaris, I mean, you know, Illumos, I think they save the whole XML of what the zone is in in the memory or something like that. Because I've I've seen that like they push whatever information they want and it always stays in the kernel. So I think they even save variables and stuff. I might Are be you wrong, sure but that I, they I... store it in the kernel or that they just write it to some slash the run file uh, it, it is a store well, but where I don't know it, it might yeah, might, it might not be us, in the kernel yeah for us it doesn't really matter because it's uh, the question of what we will do in the end uh, so whatever Solaris did can be a good uh, learning uh, point uh, learning source but uh, in the end we don't have to follow it blindly and uh, yes, for the for all the variables, uh, for example, in UCL, you don't have to have a dollar for the custom one. You you can just have a custom variable, and that's it. Uh, yep. It's easily transferable to any list, which can be saved in the kernel. So we don't care actually. Uh, we can afford not to care. Uh, so. Uh, about this, the, the, the demon and the, the JLCTL, uh, as I said, watching the last week's uh, recording, uh, I have a feeling at least that Jamie is not against any of those ideas. So I'm going to try a few and maybe some parts are going to be merged, not the whole. It's the same with the, the skeleton project. Maybe the uh, it's not going to be merged as a whole. Maybe just the printing and the conversion function are going to be merged. Still, still a huge plus uh, because never again we have to do it. And it's going to be great. But uh, what I'm trying to say is I want to try out an implementation that I have in mind. But once I start, uh, I finish experimenting with I, with what I wanted, I am not uh, like um, hell bent on, on having any specific implementation. At this point, that implementation is going to serve a purpose of me learning the technologies and well, not be so blind when, when lurking around kernjail.c. Uh, so at this point, I want to learn, and uh, at this specific moment of time, I want to uh, learn very specific thing about jails and can they be extended with Envil as the way I envision it, or I have a wrong uh, 
how to say, wrong mental image of how stuff should work. So when I say, Jan, that I'm going to ignore you for now, that's the reason I just have no idea what I'm doing. I'm smacking the keyboard uh, just slightly more <laughs> intelligent than an ape. Um, go on. Don't assume that I know more than you about the kernel implementation side of jails. I've used them. I've read code written against them. I have never <laughs> modified the kernel implementation. I've only glanced at it when debugging problems. Mm -hmm. So, so I, 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 I think we're... It sounds like ignoring my implementation ideas for a clean user space management interface is a very good idea. And thank you for explaining why uh, this doesn't apply to you. I assumed you were looking into how to design an interface between a tool suitable for getting included in base for jail management and jail managers. Exactly. And do so um, I, I think we're at the good. Okay. So Goran, your point here is you have a vision, but you don't know if, the technical design of what jails is right now would allow you to reach that vision. Everything from, you know, starting from Envilas. Young, very, very yeah. close. Sorry, very close. Uh -huh. uh, very close. I know it's technically doable and I even know how to do it. I just don't know much of a context of implementation in the curl side. And maybe it's a stupid idea. Maybe it should be done differently. And that's why I want to research. And I, I mean, I realized when I didn't know something about the program and how to evolve it, okay, try to break it in every possible way so you know where the, let's say the edges are. Something like if you don't know what the monster looks like, then put the blanket on it, right? We have mm -hmm. a, like a silhouette or, or of that. And that's what I'm actually having, a silhouette of an image of a vision of how it should be implemented. And I know I can do it unless uh, I have a, a mental image of a technical implementation uh, wrong. And maybe my implementation is going to be, how to say, technically incorrect in some way. Like, uh, okay, uh, I could say, uh, don't knowing that Envy lists uh, exist, I could re-implement them and say, okay, this is how we're going to do it. And then comes somebody who knows what he's talking about and say, well, why didn't you use this library? That's exactly what I'm going to try to, to do if I can't figure out the right way. Okay, can you figure out? Uh, it's probably what, uh, uh, um, how it's called, uh, the poems did. If I find every way that is wrong to implement it, and then I throw them all out, everything that is left is right implementation, right? So any kind <laughs> of, of either positive with the learning the, the, the right implementation way, uh, the, the positive approach or the negative learning all the wrong ones and whatever you do that is not in the set of the wrong ones must be the, the correct implementation. So with that, with that, uh, Arthur, Arthur, Arthur Conan Doyle just rolled over in his grave. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. But, but I do it a lot of times. I mean, I've done it a lot of times when, um, when one of the meetings was, if I can be smart, can I be dumb? 
okay, let, let's see every other implementation that is wrong and learn why it's wrong. So, or any kind of learning material uh, at this point is great. So uh, to, to get back to what you actually commented, sorry for the long digression, is that I know it can be done and I know it can be done with list and I know it can be done securely. But at this point, I don't know how, and I'm having I'm gonna have some baby steps where I'm gonna trip stuff over the desk and, and uh, have my kernel explode. And I already wrote something where I shouldn't. And when they say it could have been your controller for something, well, this was a controller for my keyboard. Luckily, I knew how to, to reset it. So, yeah, uh, I learned my lesson and do not do kernel development on your machine if you don't have to. Now, I should have said that I learned it for a long time ago and I did, but I don't know why I forgot it. But yeah, the, doing kernel stuff, you're the actual root user that can really do everything. Now, watch it. But yeah, that, that's the that's the idea. I'm gonna start the daemon and util implementation that are basically at the start are going to be copy of my code for the project skeleton. And uh, I'm gonna try to capsicumize as much as I can right away because later is really, really hard. I try it on some programs and it's a nightmare. So uh, it's gonna start so secure that it won't probably be able to do anything at the start. But uh, later on, I, I intend to extend it with features and one feature definitely is logging in and uh, generally executing stuff inside the jail. And uh, we probably want a demon to do that. Uh, why I say probably, uh, the, the, on the plus side, I know I want some like web implementation in the future that is outside the base uh, that can be used to control your jails uh, that can uh, talk to the Unix socket and do whatever it needs to do. Uh, on the other hand, maybe it's a security nightmare that I'm an, unaware of and it shouldn't be done ever. And whoever thinks of that should be hanged. But uh, in, in all honesty, uh, uh, I see that uh, logging through the socket, I already did that with the CBSD project that I had. So I know how it can be done and controlling TTU and stuff is uh, mm. It's a thing when you try to do that, but having a web console of your jail is a nice thing to have, uh, but we'll see if any sane implementation, sane and secure implementation can be done, which I can say with 80% certainty that we can. Uh -huh. uh, so like, like having, uh, your users, maybe you're a multi-tenant hoster and you want your users to, to have ability to log into their jails. And that would be a really neat thing for them. Uh, thinking about the, the uh, multiple uh, uh, users uh, of your system partitioned using jails. And uh, I also remember, I'm planning you mentioned hooks, but if you look at uh, what we did with the configuration, uh, create and destroy, for example, for ePair or arrays. So whatever you need to hook in there, well, just like uh, say, okay, I'm gonna have a pre-create hook 
and how you're going to uh, do it with the UCL. Well, uh, you're uh, going to have Neva. created it. No, you're, you're going to have it sooner or later because you're going to need it. Not maybe no. you per se, no, no. but people are going to need it. I, I would argue again that you're solving the wrong problem. Um, uh, well, would you at least hear what I have to say that then yes. it's wrong? Uh, what you can do, uh, it's not mandatory that you do it, but UCL allows you to have uh, any parameter as, um, as an array. You just repeat it. And that way, if you need to hook something, you will stick it there. It can be part of normal configuration if you ever need it. But if you don't, just don't add extra commands. And that's with the e pairs that we designed UCL around uh, for having automatic assigning and so on. But with uh, if you really want a hook system, then I, I think you're doing something wrong uh, in the in the big picture. What I'm trying to say is if uh, if we do the UCL part right, the hooks become trivial and we actually don't call them hooks. We just add more commands to the create tag of the, uh, of the e pair or whatever we find that needs to be done. Uh, we, can, we can put it there and completely avoid the, the problem of a hook. Um, I disagree. The problem is that you, assuming that you can pre uh, enumerate all potential use cases a user may want to do with a jail is um, basically removing the freedom which makes jail so useful and universal. You don't don't presume that you know what the user wants to do with the tool. And you may not be the only tool interfacing with this interface. Your front end is not the one true uh, interface to, to rule them all. You're not uh, creating the one wing. <laughs> well, actually we are. Uh, uh, my but intention is to kill jail managers. But in all seriousness, I uh, was talking about the daemon implementation. Mm -hmm. What the, the client, what the utility does is up to the utility. And uh, there mm -hmm. is uh, no, uh, no, no hard stop Let of me... what the utility should do. Yeah, Andre. So I actually came here today with a question, which, which, which I think it will loop back to what we are talking right now, which is this. So I have Jailer, and one of Jailer's design guidelines was I'm not going to become a service. Instead, I'm just going to be a wrapper around the jail service and the jail.com, which until now it's been working fine. But as I try to push the limits, I'm, I'm hitting those limits. Like the, the sky is not my limit. The, the bars of the jail, the walls of the jail are my limit, apparently. So, okay, I, I hit them. What do I do next? So my idea was, okay, I'm going to fork Jailer. Great. This for the first time in my life, I'm forking my own code base, where now I'm going to have two versions of it. One of them is going to be Jailer as is, where it manages configuration files, and that's it. And another one where it completely for like doesn't even uh, doesn't even believe of the existence of jail conf and the jail command, and instead it just talks with CCTL uh, with 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 syscalls directly and do whatever I want to do with any kind of management that I want with demons, no demons, clusters, and everything else. So for me personally, this makes sense because now I have the best of both worlds, right? If I have a new user, like a student, I can tell them, go use Jailer. Like it will be just creating configuration files for you. It is a bit opinionated, but you can modify it and do whatever you want. Great. Or if someone wants a Docker alternative, 
they're like, okay, use my new version of this, which doesn't even, it only uses the jail facility of FreeBSD, but not the user land tools or any of the configuration files. So the reason why I became to a scenario like this is because of the limitations that we have inside the current jail implementation, that, that, as in the jail tool. Uh, now, so what I can see here is that Goran wants to push the jail utility and the configuration so into the future that at some point, 99% of all jail managers are going to become useless. Because at the end of the day, most of us, let's be honest, are just you know configuration wrappers and we are using the jail utility. On the other hand, Jan, your concern is, I don't want that. I want not the maximum level of the jail utility, but rather the minimum level of the jail utility that can allow me to build things on top of that. Goran's argument here, if I got it right, which what I started with three, four weeks ago, which is we are doing the same thing all over again. Let's have push it, let's push all of it to base. And if I got it, we came to the conclusion that Goran, your point was if you want to use it, you know, the, the, the futuristic stuff you can. If you don't want to, you don't have to. You can keep using it as in the minimal sense. So my worry is. Uh, okay, all of this is doable, but now the all of the pain is going to go into the implementation. Thinking of, is this an array or just an integer? Is this a keyword value or is this the, the definitive value and stuff like that? So uh, this is where my problems are started with and I got to, you know, forking my own code base. But I think the same reality implies here. And I think that we're going to end up with two different jail utilities. We're going to have the current jail with jail.conf and the JLD with jailctl with jail.ucl. Does that make sense? That like yes. the, the what? Yeah, yeah, Jan? Um, yes. It, it doesn't make a lot of sense in the sense that you wouldn't want to have them interact closely with each other. But what I've found out through working on service management and init systems and basically looking at the ground everyone else considered so burnt that nobody wants to talk about init systems and service management because system D has uh, poisoned everything in the space. Just the discussion about it and the reaction to it, not even the code or a single person, but it's really hard to get people to calmly talk about this and not fall into rants. Because, for example, FreeBSD's RC is very flexible, but it's what I would call stringly type. And some of the RC.D scripts are services onto themselves, which uh, the committers are afraid of touching because it may be alive. Uh, something like the NetEF uh, RC.D script is so long and complicated and fragile, but also very flexible because everything is shell, you can extend it and so on. There are service managers like systemd where you write a unit file that just enumerate what a user is allowed to do and everything else at some point you have to, you can't just write one more shell line here or there and put it in there. Instead, you have to write it in C, upstream it, and otherwise you have to fight the system because they presume to know what users can expect of the system. And that's not what where I would want to go. What I found out is that in these cases, especially with JS, you don't have to solve this problem this completely. Instead, what you have to make is a system where the state is observable and you can notice how stale you is you are and that you can react to state changes, detect them, follow them without running into deadlock if one consumer fails. So a common problem with something like uh, DBus and other uh, reliable multicast message passes is that the whole system stops making progress as, as soon as one consumer uh, stops making progress. So a single consumer which doesn't consume what it has subscribed can deadlock the system. It's a well understood problem in system design that you can't have 
the rest of your system make progress unless you have an infinite amount of buffer space uh, and can tolerate infinite delays, which, okay, is unrealistic. But okay, so 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 you don't Jan, need you're, it because, so, so, sorry, you're, uh, you, and uh, just for me to understand yeah? this, I'm not cutting you. Your argument is you're afraid of jail, the future of no. jail becoming a system D jail. Am no. I right? But I see the parallels to between managing jails and managing normal demons. Where basically we are talking about problems which also apply to managing your database demon, your um, web server demon, what, and so on. This isn't jail specific. It's just that jails are co complicated services which require management and where users are expected to want to have operations happen around them and respond to state changes. And this is the case uh, thing we can exploit because a user, for example, doesn't care if his VPN failed five or seven times. It just He just cares that it failed at least once. So you don't need to preserve the full history of all state transitions, just that this state has been entered at least once since you last consumed your notification. So you can aggregate those and you only need... Uh, at the extreme end, a single bit per flag and consumer, but more realistic, a counter. And so FreeBSD does have the event file descriptor type since I think FreeBSD 12, if I remember correctly, but certainly in FreeBSD 13, it's available. It, it's one of the few really nice, useful things we got from Linux. It's a, basically, it's a file descriptor wrapping a 64-bit counter, which can be incremented and decremented atomically and which can for, uh, be used in an event loop with a readiness model. So you could have a directory of event file descriptors or, sockets, or a socket where you can send your event file descriptor and whoever monitors the jail state transitions, preferably through notifications from the kernel. So either he, he gets this uh, delegated through DevD or a new system interface would have to be designed so that jails can be observed by at least one observer. And that observer would be responsible for documenting to clients, basically, that the event you're interested in has happened at least once. And then the client sees, oh, this event file descriptor is uh, ready. So something like, K event or poll would return it as a ready file descriptor. Then you do the state inspection because you know what this event would notify. And only then do you consume the event by reading the file descriptor and reading the 64 bit counter value, implicitly resetting the counter. And this is an atomic operation. So reading and writing the counter. Yes? So, so I'm, I'm, going, I'm just going to act as a moderator here. So you're talking at this point about the implementation. And like Goran's mm. point was, I still don't know exactly what the implementation yes. is going to look like. I'm talking about the implementation of, a, uh, of basically multiplexing this feature so that you can have his uh, very opinionated tool live and even cooperatively interact with something else. So you could have one, let's call it a controller like in Kubernetes, watch out for VNet enabled jails to be created and it just assigns them the next free IP address. I see, I see. And okay, I see. if it gets stopped, it gets an event, it destroys the e pair and uh, reclaims your IP address for immediate reuse. And all of this would be event driven. I, I do have a suggestion, which is how about in, in next week's call, and we, we tell this everyone before they join so they can be prepared, is let's have a document where we say, okay, this is what we envision the jail utility in base to look like. And then we try to cooperate in a way where, okay, we want to have automatic e-pairs 
great. How do we do that in a non in, intrusive way where the tool doesn't become opinionated? It still be stays modular. The tooling, the tooling should be allowed to be very opinionated without punishing or harming anything else. Oh, I see what you're saying. Okay. The problem is that we are that you get a too, far too tight coupling between the jail command line and the jail functionality. I see. And the configuration file format. Which, which, which brought should me, never have to care which about. Brought me to, which brought me to my problem, right? Where now my mm -hmm. new jail manager is like, no, uh, F all of this, I'm doing it my own way, right? So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, I see what you're saying. And what I'm talking about, it has to be, what we need is a way so that you can inspect this, really, uh, indicate that you want to get updates either by from the kernel directly, which would also work, or uh, for um, um, some user space multiplexer to keep this kind of complexity in a jail assistance daemon, which is really responsible for state notifications. And with daemon or kernel functionality, both would work. Um, it's just there so that multiple controllers or jail command line tools or daemons can coexist on the same host and may even partition the workload where one is responsible for network allocation, the other for on-demand file system creation or destruction or mounting and unmounting and so on. And I just see. because you have something responsible for uh, extracting from the path name of the jail or some configuration attached with it, the template to be cloned and snapshotted or, or snapshotted and cloned, the other way around, and then some overlay mounted on top of this and so on. This part would only be responsible for responding to jail creation and putting in a template into the file system. It would not have to deal with networking as well. It, instead, you could have another control plane there and they would happily coexist, run concurrently and may, unless they you get a cycle where they basically one starts with jail, the other destroys it and it oscillates or loops. Otherwise it would just check into a stable state with a handful of state transition nets at most. Okay. Mecca, any thoughts in that regard? Uh, again, this is bringing me back to my original worry of the jail utility becoming a jail manager. And uh, I mean, yeah, okay, we understood that there are a lot of things that we, the jail utility needs, but there are apparently some, I, I want to say design limitations, but not really. Well, as I said, I don't think I can have a really educated answer because I don't know. Okay. And for the, that's actually the, the point of my, that is the sole purpose of my exercise is to, okay, what we can do maybe shouldn't be done. So... Mm -hmm. My idea was, okay, what if I just implement it, show it to Jamie, and he says, okay, this part is total gen, this is a good idea, but implement it differently, or, or some of you says that, uh, I don't actually have, I don't care who is it, as long as it progresses. So I think that I'm just going to go with... Uh, with implementation and try to understand as much of the system and then have something more tangible that we can comment on and at least we know what we dislike. Uh, this way it's, I think, too early to define anything but the syntax. And mm -hmm. uh, I actually took in my project, I took your syntax, made it somewhat differently, but not much. Uh, I was dealing with the UCL anyway, so I didn't uh, care what it contains, literally. Uh, but 
having it done that way, I realized, okay, I know how to pour everything. Uh, meaning I still don't know how to replace variables. Uh, just do the, the UCL parsing and uh, convert it to analyst. Uh, so at this point, I think we should roll our sleeves and uh, uh, see what we want with uh, configuration. How do we want to express ourselves? And maybe I have like um, different UCL configurations with the, the comments on, okay, I would like to achieve this and that. And in configuration, I would like it, like it to look like this. Maybe it's not going to be done like that because along the way, we might learn of more limitations or something. But I think at this point, it would be most fruitful if we just stick to the configuration and express ourselves through it. And see That's a good can. idea. That's a good idea, right? So yeah. maybe, maybe, maybe at the next call. And it's a way not to think about implementation while we're young and inexperienced and... Uh, uh, right. I mean, uh, none of us except Jamie now knows how the, the uh, jails really work and was, uh, I'd say, uh, if the sky is the limit, where is the sky for the jail implementation and what it can do and what it cannot do. And I think implementing anything right now except the, the, the laboratory the, the experiments, I think it's premature. And mm -hmm. also having some opinion how it should work or behave or look like or whatever, I think it's just too early. Uh, I mean, it's our, what, fourth meeting, so it means we're talking for a month. And if we were uh, had a blueprint of what needs to be implemented, we wouldn't even be at the start after a month. So all I'm saying is that let's leave the, the let's do what we can. Uh, what we definitely can is we can dream and we have our desires. And if we can express those desires through UCL, then I think we're on the right track. And, and by the way, I, I, do, I do imagine this being very similar to package and package NG, like, you know, jail and jail NG, where the NG yeah. version would be like, you know, with, if, a, the, with a demon. Yes, Jan? If it is, we're doing it wrong. <laughs> if it is, yeah. we're doing yeah. it. Because uh, <laughs> inherently there can be only one package manager responsible uh, for the files mm. and there has to be a hard cut over. If we need a hard cut over and the old command must never be re-invoked afterward, we, uh, we have failed hard at API design and implementation as yeah, well. And, and I think that we don't ever need to cross that line because what I have in mind is just a uh, Maybe one, maybe multiple, but CCTL calls that are going to be built on top of the current implementation. And they can be done so that old changing, uh, old CCTLs for uh, changing parameters just do extra work of saving it also in Envy list. So that compatibility is. I think trivial with what I want to do, uh, meaning that I just want to add stuff. Nothing is going to be changed or replaced, except the, I mean, it's functions are going to be changed, but the functionality is just going to be added. And instead of changing, uh, storing, I don't know what you want to, store like uh, there FS rules in, uh, in one variable, you're gonna have it in two. 
not the ideal case, but uh, dancing around what's in MD list and what's in the current structure, I think it would be harder. And this way, if we copy everything to the MD list, uh, in the end, we don't care if it's a new or old utility because the old utility is never going to touch new implementation, new syscalls. And uh, new implementation is just going to be built around the whole implementation of jail so it knows to, to talk so, old jail vocabulary. I think the only system call we need is one which I've wanted before but never articulated uh, in, to the FreeBSD developer. is a, a privileged system call so root only, uh, to store a file descriptor under a name in the kernel for retrieval by user space, also privileged. Uh, I've posted a link to a daemon which does this best effort style in user space, which is part of the S6 uh, service management tool suite. And they have, uh, for example, if they use the daemon tools approach to logging, so which system D claimed to have really, uh, invented, but it was already implemented in the 90s. So the thing is that <laughs> uh, system D, uh, but what we can really thank them for, and I mean this genuinely, is they uh, made it popular enough so that almost any daemon these days can be configured into a non-debug production mode where it just logs to standard out or standard error and doesn't use syslog in production or a log file. It can just write to its standard output or standard error file descriptor. And now you can take this stream where you implicitly know the source of the, all messages written to this as the other side of this pipe. But if you have two, uh, demons, one for logging log messages from the service and another one producing the log messages and one gets restarted, uh, you don't want to lose the messages in the pipe. And their solution is to put this pipe into a support demon, which is very small and really so simple that you are not expected to ever crash unless the root uh, uh, P kills it explicitly, and it's responsible for holding the onto the file descriptors so that they can be retrieved by name because file descriptors, not files, but file descriptors can't be persisted anywhere except a running process with the available portable system calls. And what I would wish for is for a system call to have a, to have some tool with uh, root permissions store this in the kernel so that this point of failure is eliminated. The other alternative to putting it in the kernel, which may would be to put it in the init process because if that process dies, the kernel will panic and the system dies as well. Uh, because as soon as the init process, PID1.xx, but cr exits and crashes, uh, the kernel will come crashing down as well intentionally. It will just write panic going nowhere without my init. So you could put it in the init process, but that would complicate the init process, uh, which really must not fail. So maybe it's better to have an operation which is allowed to at least fail to add new file descriptors, but never fail to retrieve an existing one uh, to the kernel. I'm going to quote here, and uh, unless I take care of the dog, he's going to take his statement on the carpet. Okay. Uh, <laughs> no worries. And it's, it's not that I don't agree or would hang out more. Mm -hmm. I think this, uh, I'm learning from, from this a lot, so it's so appreciated. I just really have to go. Actually, mm -hmm. he has really to go. Of course, uh, <laughs> the dog can't wait. <laughs>
Mm, no, it doesn't understand. <laughs> okay, everyone. Uh, uh, talk to you um, in front. Send me uh, invoice. I wanted to say invoice. <laughs> uh, invite uh, for the tomorrow's meeting and see you there. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Cheers. Uh, I would also like to go. If we don't have anything more to discuss, Jan, your points were very valuable. Um, Thank you. We ha have one topic which uh, I intentionally let f f uh, fall off the end, and that is what I've learned about uh, LibUCL. So okay. I was away last uh, week on vacation, so I didn't do a lot. But what I found out was uh, that um, I kind of, to make LibUCL as comfortable as possible for the user, to express his intent and for tooling mm -hmm. to generate configuration files with tools like Ansible, mm -hmm. other configuration managers. Uh, mm -hmm. I would want to avoid repeating things like the jail name again and again. Mm -hmm. like, and jail.com format already does this better than libucl does it out of the box. Uh, because in uh, the current one, you can uh, define a jail block and then use the name of the jail inside, uh, for example, the path. So you would have a yes. very defining the prefix, yes. something like slash jails, and yep. you would set the path to a, a jail prefix slash name, yep. a dollar name. But um, you can't um, do that directly in lib, uh, UCR. Mm -hmm. But oh yeah! I did, by, by the way, I, very I, I, to it. I, I did encounter that while I was playing around. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what I ended up doing is, as I am parsing, mm -hmm. yep. I am creating variables. So when That's I possible. when I know, yeah. So let's say I parsed the J block, right? I know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the name is dub dub dub. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay. Now there's a new variable called jail mm -hmm. name where the value is dub mm -hmm. dub dub. And let's say after that, what I did is usually for my own jail manager, mm -hmm. which I'm not going to use anymore. I have, for example, ID. This is for me. I use it internally. Yeah. Uh, but then I use that same ID in like the bridge and apron stuff yeah. like that. So if so, if you define a variable named ID, again, we don't use the ID mm -hmm. in the jail itself. Uh, mm -hmm. What I do is, okay, is this part of the jail? Regardless if it's part of the jail or not, mm -hmm. I now define a variable called jail underscore id equals mm -hmm. the value of id and i do that keeping going on and on and on and then when i get to a string any anything that i see the type of it is a string mm -hmm. i run my internal parser on top of it and say look out for anything yep. that is supposed to look like a variable so and i by the way mm -hmm. i quote unquote hard coded it so it always has to be dollar sign mm -hmm. open bracket uh, variable name close bracket. I yeah. think the I, I'm not sure, but I think the old one allowed it without the brackets. I'm, if, I might be wrong, but I think um, I've seen something like that. So anything that I see with the brackets and mm -hmm. the dollar sign, I'm like, okay, this is the variable. Do I have it? Modify and put the new value of the string. If I don't, mm -hmm. at the beginning, I was doing the shell style, which is like, leave it empty. And then I'm like, no, no, this is very bad. Instead, yep. I throw an error and I say, yes, this please. is a variable that's not defined. So I did this now with my Lua version that I have as a prototype only. And mm -hmm. uh, it's been going fine. And it's like, you know, it's like 20 line of code to reparse a string and change the variables and do all of that. Mm -hmm. I think that's a fine model. That's a fine thing to have in the in the end model. So yeah, that's that's yeah, and yes, libucl doesn't do that. It 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 mm -hmm. has apparently some kind of macros. But only for internal use. No, no, no. So it does have on. them, and it has an it has a documented API for register. Mm -hmm. You create basically the parser object, and mm -hmm. then you uh, then at that point you can register new macros. Oh, and the argument is already passed recursively, so that you can have a structured argument to the macro, so you mm -hmm. can. UCL object as argument to your macro inside the base and then the argument, which is normally just a string. So you could oh. like 
uh, take a look at all the options we include macro tags. And that's the one we definitely want to use, the include macro. So what you're saying that instead of saving local variables in my Lua code, I should mm -hmm. tell the parser a new macro and then libucl would the, change the strings. Mm, yes, exactly. libucl already has a, a variable expansion mechanism, but by uh -huh. default, there are only two variables, the current file oh, yeah. and the current directory. Mm -hmm. Those are documented, but you can, and that would be the harmless part, but you can already just um, add your own variables, something like the name of the jail, those mm -hmm. you're parsing. But, oh, I see. Um, you would jump, then just define it, but you would only solve a special case again. And mm -hmm. so what I came up with, I, I just uh, used uh, Alan Jude's UCL CMD to, mm -hmm. uh, to read uh, and run the macros and uh, print it out at, as UCL. So let's, mm -hmm. let me show you what uh, I did. I did there. Uh, this should be the window. Okay, I see, I see it. it. Yep. So my uh, jail looks something. Uh, jail dot UCL looks something like this. Uh, just put okay. in the version number because that's a good idea. To uh, mm -hmm. reverse that. So and then um, the idea would be that the jail tool would set um, environment variable. Oh my god, this is so nice as a concept. Like so I will. Oh, yeah. I want to. Uh, have environment variables which are the default, mm -hmm. and then uh, so uh, it tries to include. So if it doesn't exist, it's not an error, and it would be trivial to pre-register the variable of directories to uh, search through, so that you have mm -hmm. one under slash etc if it ever goes into base, and another mm -hmm. one under usr local etc jld, so that you can hook in there. And now I don't mean hook in like run a command, but extend mm -hmm. this this subtree in a structured mm -hmm. way. And mm -hmm. it just looks for files looking like uh, .conf. Mm -hmm. So star.conf expands to matches anything as a glob, which doesn't start with a dot and ends in a .conf. So so this is path.d slash anything.conf. No, no, no. It searches through, through n it searches in all oh, directories. Sorry, and, this is yeah, a list and, of yeah, paths okay. to directories to okay. be searched for files matching this glob. Okay. This is already implemented. In okay. This is built into libucl. Okay. The Can I see your file structure? Yes, exactly. Mm. Oh, okay. I see what you did there. So okay. The idea is, I just wanted something to set here. And the default yeah. ones would be nf.d locale, which is just set the locale to C, override yep. any locale which may have leaked, and set a default path. Mm -hmm. For all, so that all the hooks invoked would have a locale effectively disabled, mm -hmm. so that you get the deterministic collocation and so on, and a search path which is probably close enough to everything you want to find. Mm -hmm. But don't assume, just let the user do it. Okay. Now, looking back at the file, um, the under the exact, my idea is that I would have one for the prepare and so on. So it would have exact. And then mm -hmm. these are the default ones, which are global. So for mm -hmm. every jail, or maybe even be before starting any jail. Mm -hmm. That could be argued. The idea what, what I came up with was that I would maybe want to have something to be done before a jail is started, the first one, or before a jail is ever stopped, which makes a bit, little mm -hmm. bit less sense. But basically, prepare the host, maybe import the zpool containing all the jails, stuff like this. Mm -hmm. And you're, at that point, yes, you get going into service management, less jail management, but or just logging and reporting something to syslog mm -hmm. that you know where you are so that you can put a trivial hook in there as logging. Mm -hmm. And the next stuff is here. Now define the jails. And again, I have a directory jail.d. But, and this is a limitation in uh, 
libuc l which i want to overcome right now now i have a configuration I, let's say i have a jail running an async server and another an mqtt broker mm -hmm. just as example and the mqtt one now contains a block mentioning that this is the mqtt jail mm -hmm. and here again it mentions that okay look in the mqtt.d.env.d so it repeats the jail name Mm -hmm. uh, multiple times. Yep. And this is something I really want to get rid of because it means that this file, although it has the same identical structure for all jails, is not mm -hmm. identical because it differs in this one little detail, namely the jail name. Mm -hmm. And this is where the pre-registered variable would be useful. But if we add double indirection to the include, where you can basically say, not include these files, but take this included file and run it under this directory name in this directory and go through this directory per jail. You, maybe then I would have a template configuration to be applied with the name as variable pre-registered for each jail. And mm -hmm. then I can have this one be extensible. And basically I want to have a, a single jail.con, basically jail prototype conf, which would still allow me to extend it for, and then run this for each jail with the name registered. And if we ignore that the this isn't possible right now, but just imagine that all of these mqtt.conf and asuk.conf are just reference dollar name there mm -hmm. because the better macro is already implemented. Then we can mm -hmm. go along the same line and look into the mqtt.dd directory. And here I have again the um, uh, FS layout, which just sets the path and path prefix, mm -hmm. although in this case, if we have all of this, we don't have to implement the logic of combining a prefix and appending the mm -hmm. name. We would just write it out. Mm -hmm. Then we can have another one. And these files, and this is something I wanted to show, aren't uh, normal files. They are some links to snippets I wanted to enable for this jail. So mm -hmm. I would only put it in and then I would zoom link or unlink these snippets. By the way, uh, off topic question, why do you always define the operating system version in your GL cons? Uh Just because I wanted some example which to a value to okay. set. Not because I have to. Just because I wanted some structured data there which is meaningless and generic but applicable to any jail potentially. Not because there's any good reason to override this normally. You would do this if you want to, uh, for example, build packages for an mm -hmm. older version, because otherwise the system would read some port would run uname or read the default sysctl for it and would get the host kernel version and may oh, yeah. falsely detect that certain ABIs are available to it. And thereby, and by um, setting these, you can report that you only support the old feature set. I see. So the, the same exists for the Linux uh, compatibility layer. So basically, yep, no, yep, yep. you're running on an even older version of Linux. Please do this and this. Uh, it's basically to lie about how new you are and which features can be auto detected because. Lots of build systems out there are very badly written and will just not care about your configure flex. If they see a shared library, they will just uh, link against it anyway. And then uh, the package you've built on your personal workstation uh, will not work on your uh, other. On your, the package you've built on your laptop won't work on your uh, desktop or something mm -hmm. because the. GNU auto break and GNU auto fuck uh, decided to uh, screw you over <laughs> and, and auto detect that oh you have this uh, you have a 
OpenSSL from ports installed. Let's use the new OpenSSL. Oh, the, the program doesn't start because uh, libssl is, uh, and libcrypto are missing. What? <laughs> yeah. And that, you that can avoid, sense. yeah. Or so so that, so UCL has a function called the register macro. Yes, for and, which I can use that. I see what you're and saying. And I've looked into the macros, and as I've already uh, posted on the channel, I've not found two problems with that. Mm -hmm. uh, one is that I wanted to use the inherit uh, macro instead of the mm -hmm. um, include macro because then I could have the snippets to be included in some mm -hmm. otherwise that subtree of a configuration and would just mm -hmm. inc include them and avoid reparsing them. I would just hook these mm -hmm. objects over in a reactive subtree in, as default. I see. This would be nice and this is what uh, Alan Jude requested and has gotten uh, from the original library developer as uh, issue 100, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that he never thought about uh, using a nested structure there. He only want, oh. thought about putting those uh, default values to be imported into sub-objects on the top level of the configuration tree. Mm -hmm. And because of that, he uh, the example, the macro included uses uh, a non-recursive lookup in the root object so that it doesn't split the lookup path at the uh, mm -hmm. selected separator, which is a single dot by default, but we should uh, change that to slashes for gels because uh, gels can be expected to include a dot in the name. So um, we should move to a separator which is, isn't available to gels and slash is the most natural one when dealing with file systems uh, for me as a Unix user. Um, so uh, the recursive that one to preserve um, existing configurations, I would use the non-recursive one first. And if it doesn't return a result, then do the recursive lookup. Uh, that way a hit using the separator would override it, but I do not consider that a problem because uh, again, putting the separator in a, especially a slash separator, at the root of your jail.conf, yes, you can shoot yourself in the foot. You just mm -hmm. don't have to point a loaded shotgun uh, at your feet and pull the trigger. If you know what, really, yes, you can break it. You can also put syntax errors in there. It's about the same thing. But um, the next step is, now that I have all this here in um, in the exec, for example, um, here. Oh, there's nothing here yet because I didn't get to it. But let's mm -hmm. look at the. What? Uh, so, OK, uh, in the end, I here. I probably put in here some network configuration parameters. Okay, mm -hmm. easy. Those could live there. And yes, this is all meaningful to the tooling because mm -hmm. the hooks, that's my the, how I would want to do it is uh, the hooks uh, get access to these uh, environment variables through their normal Unix environment, mm -hmm. either prefixed or unprefixed. Um, can be argued either way. In this case, it's kind of natural to just use the full name. Do we want to reserve some names? Uh, do we don't want to do it. I, I'm open to both. Um, but um, the other thing is then the hooks, so the exec would have one layer uh, beneath it, something like start, pre-start, stop, post-stop, uh, prepare, destroy, stuff like that. Basically, all the existing ones would be carried over uh, as a level of nesting in the per jail uh, configuration tree of the global configuration to be built up. And that way, you can have multiple ones. And if I want to have this, I would just put in which, uh, which and e pair allocated to the jail first. And then mm -hmm. I would zoom link in the reference to the hook to uh, create the j uh, the e pair and pass it to the vnet 
maybe even one another one to assign an address to it post start or something uh, or post create or whatever. There's a hook to be little before the normal startup happens, but after the jail has been created. Mm -hmm. to put something before the normal uh, run the RC scripts. Uh, or you can just prefix these. Um, and that way you don't have to deal with expanding the variables into shell scripts because what I've seen happen with co more complex gel configurations in the current format is that you get ever longer lines and we don't have to do that because libucl already has a macro to uh, include uh, a file, a string. Then you get a string value, which are uh, containing the shell script. And you could have just, if it ends in dot .h sh or something, uh, load it so that you load it in as a new hook. And that uh, what we what so wait I that's that's a need... with UCL thing where where I can tell UCL to load the file or do yes. we have to do that manually? No, no, you can do it in libucl. The dot load macro does it. It's a oh, the do it's okay. included. Okay, it's included I see what in you're the saying. default. Uh, uh, again, you can thank Alan Jude for that. <laughs> okay, uh, nice. Uh, because he asked for it and he's gotten it. It's not that complicated of a macro but um and i no longer think it's a good idea to use the inherit mechanism at all because the parser is so much faster than human time scales mm -hmm. that uh, including it and reparsing the same file again and again but with mm -hmm. different variables preloaded so that they can get expanded is uh, a, the better way to go about it and what we are not and we are almost there, but there's a bug, a real bug in this case, in libucl that um, it kind of wants to uh, strip file names uh, ending in .conf or .ucl when deriving um, the key to be included. So what you can do I see. is normally you can use basically prefix the content of a file inside an object as a key so basically you would include it and what you get is a a key under of named after the file without the prefix as an object or you can also pass to include a type hint that you expect it to become a, an array instead of an object mm -hmm. so the, this is important if you want to have it look the same structurally if you have zero one and multiple so that you don't get a different shape of subtree if you uh, have exactly one. Mm. Nice, very nice. But uh, there's a bug there that uh, the prefix variable is initialized uh, on the first match of the glob mm -hmm. and then stripped and never unset. And the next time it sees, oh, it's already set, so I can't strip a prefix again. So it only strips the prefix on the first match. Other, the later ones include the, the suffix name. It's a simple bug. Uh, it's probably less than five lines to patch to change it, but you have to kind of make sure you get all the corner cases. Uh, that at least would solve this, but what I really want to have is basically an include of directories so that the include doesn't include a single file, but includes uh, basically it runs for each file a directory to be included a file so that I have a double indirection and then I can control mm -hmm. by having this file include something. I can put a, in a place to extend the template to be expanded. And then I, you can extend the, the structure. Um, because what I, what I really want to avoid is this assumption that the author knows everything the user can ever want of the system. This idea that, no, 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 it's evil to allow users to write code here. We have to have a configuration option for everything. And if it's not uh, included, uh, you can't have it. 
which is why I really, for example, if you build an ePair support, that's fine. Mm -hmm. But maybe I don't want to use ePair. Maybe I want to have a VXLAN or um, mm -hmm. a, a WireGuard tunnel or some other kind. Maybe I'm using NetGraph to build my networking overlay. And I have my own NetGraph node type, which the author has never seen because it's maintained in some port somewhere. And I've installed uh, something, some completely different kind of encapsulation. Or I have some DPU attached, which maybe one day gets ready for production use so that you can have nice things and just have the networking card handle the encapsulation and you just have to provide it a big tag and the networking card will handle all of the packet encapsulation and wrapping and the host CPU isn't burdened with that. Oh, also an off-topic question. Mm -hmm. Can I create a WireGuard interface on the host and then just use if config to pass it to a VNet? Good question. The, I don't know what happens in that case. Right, Some kind cause... of interfaces, I think GRE is one of them, have support for existing and different VNets on the upper and lower layer. OpenBSD does support this, where I know it, but they don't have a VNet. They call it VRF and VRF Lite, yeah. following the Cisco terminology. And there yeah. you can have the under and overlay uh, be in different routing domains. Oh, interesting. Uh, and that's an that's... intentional feature because maybe you have some, let's say you're an ISP and you have some uh, VPN product, not the scam VPN, but something useful to a corporation where you have a little box there and they just want to have uh, your, provide them a, vir a virtual ethernet layer mm -hmm. two between all of their uh, sites. And you're supposed to also do some non-unicast filtering uh, so that it scales far enough and your lines aren't always flooded with uh, multicasting printers or something. Yeah. <laughs> but they want to have the feeling of an almost shared layer two between sites. And now you have, multi you have your um, internal routers and you could do this, for example, with MPLS if you're a bit mm -hmm. older or you can use <laughs> tons of technologies. I uh, know <laughs> if you're in the ISP legacy mindset, oh, you, you could just use uh, WireGuard or IPsec tunnels or whatever, but you have your underlay, which is just your, your transport, which is kind of part of the internet. Um, and then you tunnel your um, customer traffic on top of that. And in that case, it makes total sense to have the uh, under delay be in the default routing domain and each customer attached to a router be its own mm -hmm. uh, routing domain. And you can easily build that with OpenBSD. It's just, you can even run routing demons per routing domain or something or mm -hmm. so that you can have your uh, OpenBSD BGP daemon puzzle default route to each customer so that they don't just or stuff hmm. like that they want to get oh, nice nice and okay so this that is, is actually interesting because i because i've seen i've seen a scenario where i can do if config and then mm -hmm. a hardware ethernet like eth zero you know yeah vnet and give it to gl now the gl yep. is an actual physical okay that does make sense right but um, in case so, of WireGuard, it sounds complex. Not really. Uh, you can uh, WireGuard is a UDP tunnel. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's still no need, more complex still routed, uh, right? than any other kind of IP tunneling via mm. GIE or whatever. Um, let me see tunnel. Okay, no. Um, looks like FreeBSD only supports specifying the tunnel uh, FIP yep. and not the tunnel. Uh, looks like you can't do that right now. 
Excellent remote. No, it looks group. like we. Oh, sorry, what? No, just saw VXLine group remotely cast. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, oh, VXLine has, has been... a mode where, where um, the non unicast traffic or traffic to unknown addresses but the, yep. is multicasted to a group. Oh, nice. And oh, apparently they, a... apparently they apparently they changed some things in the VXLAM implementation in the last couple of years because I don't remember seeing these many things before. Um, I don't know. Maybe well, it just wasn't documented. But yeah, they did extend oh. it. For example, it finally supports an IPv6 underlay and stuff like this. Oh. And so you can even disable learning mm -hmm. um, to prevent it and then have some controller manage the uh, details. Mm -hmm. uh, they have some um, ahead of time control plate store all possible supported endpoints on this VXLAN. And this avoids ever having to deal with uh, non-unicast traffic unless you support multicast payloads or mm -hmm. broadcast payloads. But you avoid the case uh, you get a very chatty network where you suddenly flood um, where you suddenly start flooding tiny uh, network management packets um, everywhere because that just doesn't really scale. And for example, um, you, um, a German uh, FreeBSD based host has written a nice, sadly German only blog post about it where they uh, described their problems that. What was happening in the jail hosting setup was that they put all the jails with the alias address mm -hmm. on the uh, direct directly on the network, and then okay, that was already bad enough. But then now they try to add VLANs, and suddenly you have all the ARP and multicast traffic of someone running oh. Wahi, and the uh, top of rack switch. Um, TCAM and uh, Mac OS tablets just explode and it falls back to uh, just flooding uh, mm -hmm. and your whole network collapses. And even if you have enough capacity to buy and have expensive enough switches, once you get, get, get big switches, which aren't built around a single big memory fast enough to handle all packets going through a single uh, main memory buffer, uh, but have proper crossbars, a crossbar may be non-blocking, but only for unicast traffic because mm -hmm. broad, uh, and uh, multicast traffic tap the crossbar multiple times, thereby blocking all the diagonals between the tabs. And then unless, or you have to duplicate it out and then you have a lot of traffic uh, concern going through your crossbar. And yeah, and for example, in that case, you may want to run a routing uh, protocol on the host and have something like OSPF or BGP um, manage your layer free reachability and have each jail host act as router with an e pair for each VNet enabled jail mm -hmm. and you aggregate it all if you can so that you have one uh, slash 64 per jail host uh, for IPv6 and a slash whatever something between the 16 and a slash 24 per jail host as well in IPv4 land and the jails are allocated out of this address range available to the host and if you have to migrate a jail, okay, your layer three routing table gets deaggregated because you have to announce the more specific host routes. But as long as this is an uncommon procedure or you migrate the whole network for all jails, um, you can avoid uh, torturing your uh, top of rack layer three switches or maybe cheap routers. Uh, way of learning too many adjacencies. I see. And, but, yeah. 
Well, this was fun. We learned a lot. But can you can you post your uh, UCL configuration that you generated the whole tree somewhere? Yeah. Maybe on, give me on a second. Gstor. Yeah. Give me um, a just any location, and uh, I think it would be fun. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Or oh, touring it. Okay, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> Yeah, with maybe some empty directories, garbage, and old ideas in there. And I think it's okay. Can you just uh, send me a direct message with your uh, email address or something? Yeah, sure, sure. I'll 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 text you on IRC. Good. Sounds good. Send, uh, and I, you can have it. It's not a. But, but uh, the important part is that what's missing is this uh, extended include. With, an, with two layers of indirection instead of one to make the last indirection layer extendable. Mm, I see. So that you are never forced to put the jail specific part you don't want to generate in a, a file. So that you never have to explicitly state the jail name and so on. I see. Um, because uh, that makes it so much more tooling friendly. You put your variable using configuration snippet in the right place, and then you put in some links into directories to reference it, mm -hmm. which is very tooling friendly for things like Ansible and so on. If you do it with Ansible, it's enough to use the, uh, the file um, module for managing the the links and the template module to tem get generate the template. The problem is that the overhead per mm, loop through a module is so high with Ansible, unless you're using a mat Mitogen, that it gets annoyingly slow. And that's the po point where a dedicated module helps because you only start one Python process for the whole invocation of the module instead of one per loop through the generic module, even if the resulting role is just two or three lines mm -hmm. shorter. I see. 